Good morning. We are live from River Valley Room. Well, good morning, everyone. Sorry for the brief delay. I'd like to call the September 5th, 2023 meeting of the Utility Committee to order by first acknowledging that we convene on the traditional lands of Treaty 6, which is also the home of members of the Métis Nation of Alberta, Inuit, and non status Indigenous peoples. We recognize the long history and contributions of Indigenous peoples who have cared for this land from time immemorial to the present. We are committed in the spirit of truth and reconciliation to working collaboratively to steward the land we share as we plan a future for all citizens. And we acknowledge that we are all treaty people bound to one another by the spirit and intent of treaty as long as the sun shines, the grass grows, and the river flows. I'll start with a roll call, first of all, of committee members. Councillor Paquette. Good morning. Good morning, Councillor Jans. Good morning. Good morning, Councillor. Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Salvador. Good morning. Good morning, Councillor Stevenson. Good morning. Good morning, and Councillor Tang. Good morning. Uh, and I will note first of all that we are joined by uh, the utility. Uh, Mr. Beckett and I'm just looking to see if we have other councillors with us this morning. Uh, councillor Knack. Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Rice. Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Wright. Good morning. And Councillor Principe. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so, I'd start with a motion to adopt the agenda. Uh, so moved. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Please vote. Waiting on. I'm in favor. Thank you, Councillor Jones. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. That is carried. Uh, a motion to approve the minutes. I'll move that we approve the minutes of the May 9th, 2023 Utility Committee meeting. 
Thank you. Councillor Stevenson, please vote. In favor. Thank you, Councillor Jans. We have other vote. Thank you. Please display the vote. That is carried. Protocol items, I am not aware of any. Selection of items for debate. Feel free to jump in. Sure, I will select items seven, one, two, and three. Thank you, Councillor. Oh. Maybe I can just jump in. I'll yeah. select seven four. Seven four. Thank you, Councillor Tang. That is all of the items on our agenda. So there is no need for a vote on other items. Requests to speak. Yes, I'll move that we hear the utility committee hear from the following speaker on item 7.3, Christine Qualchuk from the Edmonton River Valley Cons Conservation Coalition. Great, thank you. Please vote. We have a vote. Thank you. Please display the vote. That is carried. That takes us directly to. Oh, uh, are there any councillor inquiries this morning? Not aware of any. Very good. That takes us then to item 7.1. EPCOR 2022 performance-based regulation rate progress report. Uh, so I presume there's a presentation first of all. So we'll call forward. Uh, representatives from EPCOR and uh, hear that presentation. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Saqib Chaudhary. I'm the Director of Regulatory for EPCOR Water Services. And I'm uh, accompanied with uh, my colleagues from uh, EPCOR Water Services uh, this morning who will assist me with uh, any questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Uh, our presentation this morning, uh, as everyone is uh, aware, is to provide a summary of the performance-based regulation report for 2022. Uh, next slide, please. So just to provide some background, uh, the progress report is prepared on an annual basis and is intended to provide the City of Edmonton with an update on EPCOR water services, operational and financial results for each of the utilities regulated under bylaw 19626 and 19627. Uh, throughout this report, uh, references are, will be made to EPCOR Water Services, Inc., as well as EPCOR Drainage Services, as these were the EPCOR business units that existed in 2022. Um, however, uh, starting in July 2023, EPCOR Water Services, Inc. and uh, Drainage Services have been amalgamated into a single business unit, which is named EPCOR Water Services, which will be responsible for carrying on the commitments under our PBR plans referenced in the progress reports. Uh, <clears throat> as indicated on this slide, today's presentation will provide a high-level summary of 2022 results focusing on consumption, financial results, capital expenditures, operational performance measures, as well as bill comparisons. Next slide, please. Uh, on this slide here, we've provided a summary of our forecast versus actual for both customers and consumption. Uh, in 2022, for each of the regulated utilities, uh, both measures uh, exceeded the PBR forecast for each customer class. Um, the factors that were driving higher consumption uh, related to the fact that we had higher forecast uh, customer growth in uh, both the residential and commercial segments. And what was driving that is the forecasts for the PBR were developed during the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, uh, during that period of uncertainty, uh, there was a uh, uh, measured approach in terms of forecasting customer growth. Uh, on an actual basis, we've seen that customer growth has, has exceeded the forecast. 
Uh, a second uh, contributing factor is the fact that commercial consumption has recovered to pre-pandemic levels uh, faster than we had anticipated. And uh, thirdly, uh, we've had an unusually hot and dry summer this year, which, which drove higher consumption in uh, all of the, the customer segments. So on an overall basis, this results in 7.8% higher consumption volume than, than we had forecasted in our PBR plan. Next slide, please. So, and this culminates into an increase in, in revenues. And as I think everyone is aware, um, in our last PBR, the uh, uh, utility uh, or uh, EPCOR adopted a consumption deferral account. And what that means is any uh, uh, revenue in excess of what was forecasted uh, would be refunded back to customers in the subsequent PBR term. And so this slide here summarizes the, uh, the dollar amounts of, of that deferral. And so on an overall basis, uh, $19.7 million across the three utilities will be refunded to customers in the next PBR term. Uh, next slide. So over the next few slides, what we'll do is uh, we'll summarize the financial performance, including capital expenditures for each of our regulated utilities. And we'll start with the in-city water. Um, so overall financial performance for in-city water was uh, slightly better than forecast. Uh, In-city water revenues were slightly, uh, what was contributing to that was uh, uh, slightly higher than forecast revenues of, of $3 million, uh, so 1.4%, which was largely due to higher customer counts and higher than forecast consumption during the first three months of, of 2022. And it's important to note because the first three months of 2022 uh, were not subject to the deferral account um, as the new rates took, took into effect April 1. On an overall basis, operating expenses were in line with forecast. Um, other contributing factors are uh, revenue offsets, which reflect uh, revenues from temporary services, such as uh, water permits, late fees, and uh, other, incidents, other incidental services were lower than forecast. Depreciation and amortization was slightly lower than forecast by $1.3 million, primarily due to the timing of, of when certain capital projects were completed such as the Kisikau Pism Solar Farm. Uh, cost of debt was slightly higher than forecast due to higher interest rates as a result of the uh, uh, Bank of Canada increasing rates in 2022, which were higher than what we had forecast. And the cumulative effect of all of these differences results in in-city water earning a, RO, a return on equity of 8.36% uh, relative to the forecast ROE of 7.90%. Next slide, please. Turning to capital expenditures for in-city water, um, for 2022, uh, capital expenditures were $34 million than forecast. And we're forecasting for the five-year PBR term from 2022 to 2026, uh, they're projected to be 28% or, or $121 million higher than originally forecast. Uh, what's driving these variances is, is uh, a few uh, specific projects, which I'll, I'll get into some details here. So approximately $46 million of this, this difference uh, over the upcoming PBR term is, is driven by projects that were delayed and carried over from the previous PBR term. Uh, examples include the uh, Kisikau Pism Solar Farm and Battery Storage System, which was delayed due to the timing of uh, regulatory and bylaw approvals. Uh, we had a delay to the implementation of the lead control due to the time it, due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And we also had some delays associated with our water and drainage real estate co consolidation project uh, due to changes in scope and the need to address higher than expected con uh, construction bid costs. In addition to the delayed projects, we had higher than forecast capital expenditures that were driven by external factors and we expect to see that to continue over the, the PBR term. And these relate to higher than anticipated volume of utility infrastructure relo relocate requ requests uh, related to the LRT expansion, the Yellowhead Trail upgrades, as well as water distribution main upgrades, which accounts for another $40 million of the difference. Um, uh, another significant driver of the variance over the PBR term relates to developer-driven growth. Uh, these projects include network private development transmission mains, as well as water services connections program. And this accounts for approximately $37 million of the increase. Next slide, please. 
for wastewater, uh, wastewater achieved stronger than forecast financial performance in 2022, and this is driven by a few factors which we'll get into. Um, similar to in-city water, uh, wastewater's revenues were $2.1 million higher than forecast. Uh, again, this relates to the uh, higher consumption in the first quarter of 2022 before the deferral uh, uh, account treatment came into effect, as well as higher overstrength surcharges from industrial customers. Uh, revenue offsets also contributed to the strong financial performance as these revenues were $1.3 million higher than forecast and that primarily relates to increased volumes of biosolids management and, and treatment for the Alberta Capital Region Wastewater Commission. Um, another factor contributing to the higher than forecast uh, return on equity is a lower than forecast uh, rate base and that's related to uh, uh, delays in uh, having assets placed in service from the previous PBR term. Despite the strong 2022 results, uh, we expect average ROE over the 2022 to 2024 PBR term to near the approved ROE of 9.64%. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of capital expenditures for wastewater, um, we're more in line with uh, uh, the PBR forecast and they will be so over the three year period as well. Um, however, we've had a, a number of uh, ups and downs uh, within the uh, capital program. And so what we've done is we've uh, ensured to rebalance the overall capital envelope uh, to ensure that we're responding to changing priorities, managing risks and, and maintaining our performance standards. So examples of, of uh, some of the decreases that we've uh, experienced or will experience over the PBR term is uh, deferral of the Clover, Ball, Clover Bar Biosolids Dewatering Facility uh, by approximately $38 million. And uh, we've deferred that due to higher than expected costs and we're reassessing alternative options including the long-term viability of, of using a, a contractor in mobile dewatering. Um, other impacts are we've extended the schedule for projects such as the Gold Bar Primary Affluent Channel Upgrade, our Control Room Electrical Upgrade, as well as a 600 volt electrical building upgrade uh, into the next PBR term in order to minimize operational disruptions and better manage the overall capital uh, envelope. Um, cost projects that are offsetting these deferrals, um, we had the Utility Rack West project, $9.5 million a biogas system upgrade for $12 million, as well as enhanced primary treatment scrubber upgrade for $15 million. Uh, next slide. Um, so this brings us to the drainage 2022 financial performance. And so on an overall basis, drainage's financial performance was slightly lower than the forecast ROE of 6.32%. Uh, you'll note that the uh, forecast ROE for drainage is lower than the forecast ROE for water and wastewater and that relates to the fact that the drainage approved ROE is uh, um, ramped up gradually over the PBR term from 2022 to 2026 to mitigate the rate impact on customers. Uh, following the similar trends in, in water and wastewater, revenue for drainage services was higher than forecast by $2.2 .2 million. Again, that relates to higher uh, growth and consumption in, in the uh, first three months of 2022. Operating expenses for drainage were, were higher than forecast by $5.3 million. Difference was primarily, primarily driven by increases in costs for drainage planning and operations, higher than forecast billing, meter reading, and customer service charges due to higher customer growth, and higher than forecast shared services costs due to wage inflation. Depreciation and amortization were slightly lower than forecast by $2.3 million, again uh, related to the timing of the in-service dates for various capital projects. And similar to water, cost of debt was, was higher than forecast due to higher than expected interest rates. So the cumulative effect of these differences results in drainage earning a ROE of 6.18% uh, versus the uh, uh, forecast ROE of 6.32%. Next slide, please. In terms of capital expenditures for drainage, uh, they were slightly higher in 2022 than forecast and over the 2022 to 2024 PBR term, uh, we're project projecting them to be slightly greater than forecast by $22.5 million. Again, similar to wastewater, this reflects the fact that we've been uh, uh, shifting between the various capital projects to refine and reprioritize our overall capital programs 
to ensure that we're appropriately addressing asset condition, mitigating the risk of failure, and maintain required service levels. Uh, significant shifts in the capital program include uh, we've had higher spend on the drainage system expansion uh, projects, that's approximately $13 million. Higher spend on drainage system rehab projects to address asset condition, that's approximately $35 million. Higher spend on the water drainage shared facility due to construction delays uh, driven by scope and design changes, and that was approximately $25 million. And higher than forecasted spend on the corrosion and odor mitigation program, which is approximately $15, or $15 million. These increases were offset by lower spend on uh, the dry pond program, uh, approximately $33 million. And this relates to uh, longer than anticipated time frames and land assembly and uh, uh, work required for public consultation, which is pushing some of the capital expenditures into the next PDR term. We've also had lower spend on drainage neighborhood renewal projects by approximately $24 million. And again, this is related to the fact that we needed to refocus resources on uh, emergency drainage system rehab projects. Next slide, please. So that brings us to the uh, uh, next part of our presentation where we summarize the uh, operational performance metrics. And so these, these measures, they're an integral part of our approved PDR framework. And these uh, performance standards are outlined in the, uh, the, the bylaws. Um, so to provide a bit of background, the performance, it's measured by a result of uh, uh, multiple indices with each index consisting of one or, one or more performance measures. Uh, performance are, for each index is measured independently on a point basis with 100 base points available if the standards for all indices are achieved. Um, EPCOR Water Services is, is able to earn bonus points if performance above standards is met, uh, whereas financial penalties can apply if uh, EPCOR Water Services does not, does not meet the 100 point base standard. Uh, the performance standards, they cover areas related to water quality, customer service, system reliability, environmental performance, and safety. Um, the details of how each of these index indices are calculated are included in the full PDR progress report. So in addition, um, at the conclusion of each year, we have an independent audit that's performed to assess uh, the calculation of those measures uh, before they're reported to the city. So uh, in summary, uh, for 2022, in-city water exceeded the performance standards for all five of its performance uh, measures. Wastewater treatment exceeded the performance standards for three of its perfo four performance measures. And drainage services exceeded the performance standards for all four of its performance measures. Next slide, please. Um, and so this, this last portion of our presentation just provides a bill comparison for uh, uh, the various utilities. Um, so on an annual basis, uh, EPCOR Water Services prepares these bill co uh, comparisons using published water, wastewater treatment, sanitary and stormwater rates for various Canadian cities and local municipalities. Um, this first chart here focuses on the residential water bill and this chart illustrates that for 2022, using an average consumption of 14 cubic meters per month, that Edmonton's water bills are competitive with most cities and local <coughs> municipalities. Um, Vancouver continues to have the lowest rates due to its excellent water uh, source quality in comparison to, to Edmonton. Next slide, please. So this next slide, it's a, a view providing uh, the residential sanitary drainage and wastewater bill. And uh, again, this is based on 14 cubic meters per month. And so although Edmonton's sanitary drainage and wastewater bills appear higher relative to the comparison communities, um, the comparison does, doesn't reflect the fact that the impact of historical spending decisions uh, of each community. Um, for example, for EPCOR Water Services, um, you know, we've expended or continue to expend significant resources on the corrosion and odor reduction program to address corrosion issues and to remediate long-running odor issues in, a, in our sanitary sewers. Um, included in our uh, uh, 5163 there, uh, $2.94 in 2022 related specifically to the uh, uh, corrosion and order reduction program. Next slide. And so this next slide brings us to the average monthly residential stormwater bill. And uh, so the nature and extent, similar to uh, the previous slide, the nature and extent of stormwater drainage services varies amongst municipalities related to geography as well as climate impacts. 
uh, different cities face different risks related to storms, over, overland flooding, as well as sea level. Uh, in addition, the rates charged reflect the differences in how utilities have responded to addressing these risks. So in some, in some municipalities, uh, flood mitigation and stormwater drainage charges are included in property taxes, which makes this comparison uh, somewhat challenging. For example, uh, Vancouver and Winnipeg are, are not reflected on our chart here, um, as those are collected through property taxes and no data is available. Um, EPCOR Water Services has been very proactive in addressing the increased risk of, of flooding related to climate change, and we're making substantial investments in stormwater uh, through our Stormwater Integrated Resource Plan to assess and mitigate these risks, which is, which is driving the, uh, uh, the, the, the rates that are reflected in this chart. Um, although, however, our uh, average stormwater bills are comparable to cities that have also started addressing these risks, such as Calgary, St. Albert, and Regina. Uh, and that brings us to the conclusion of, of our report, and uh, we're happy to take any questions. Great, thank you. Uh, appreciate the presentation. Uh, lots of information and data there. Uh, I think what I'll do is first go to uh, Mr. Beckett and see if he has any comments on the reports that have been presented. I noticed on slides five, seven, and nine where the return on equity is calculated that um, all three of those were favorably impacted by lower mid-year rate base equity. And I think the explanation was um, delayed capital expenditures due to the pandemic. But I'd, I'd uh, like to know whether or not that capital expenditure, those capital expenditures are going to get caught up during the rest of the PBR period. So, Mr. Beckett, some of those, uh, not all of the delays are, are related to uh, the impact of the pandemic, but uh, some of those uh, uh, capital expenditures will be caught up during the current PBR term. Um, as I indicated, uh, um, you know, when we were looking at the PBR, uh, PBR envelope for capital for the different utilities, what we're um, uh, attempting to do is, is manage the overall capital envelope, and so looking at where we can defer projects that were forecast to, to happen between 2022 and 2024 and possibly defer them into the, uh, the next PBR period. So, so, so to answer your question, um, some of the capital will be caught up, but there will be some offsetting reductions to, to manage our overall PBR envelope. Thank you. Yeah, any, yeah please proceed, Mr. Beck. So the caution I'd uh, provide is that uh, with PBR, um, it's important to get the capital forecast as close as possible to what's actually going to occur uh, and to ensure that there's no incentive to uh, forecast capital expenditures that are not going to occur uh, because of the impact that has on earnings. Uh, I, I don't uh, suggest that that's happening here, but it's an area that um, uh, needs to be watched pretty carefully, uh, particularly uh, in the next PBR when these r these roosters come home to roost, if you like, uh, and there has to be an explanation as to why uh, expenditures were lower than forecast. Uh, saying that you're trying to manage the capital envelope, well, that should be done as part of the PBR uh, as well. It should be uh, well managed to ensure that actual expenditures come as close as, as reasonably possible to forecast expenditures. Yeah, and so I, I'm sort of paraphrasing, I guess, first of all to Mr. Beckett, but it, it sounds like there's been a lot of change in capital plans which were only crafted just a couple of years ago when the PBRs were filed. Is that another, is that a reasonable summary? You, you, you've uh, summarized it very well. And I, And as part of that, one of the questions I had was, you know, I think the response was there'll, there'll be a true up on the next PBR filing. Uh, but right now today, we've got different PBR periods. Uh, wastewater and drainage are to 2024, in water is to 2026. And I think there was gonna be some sort of a reconciliation of those, but can you remind us what that is and perhaps comment on the capital plan true ups then? 
Uh, yep, you are correct. Uh, so the timing will be different. So we'll be bringing in the wastewater and drainage um, uh, in 2024, and that'll reflect an updated forecast. So we'll, um, as part of our rate application, it'll reflect the, the true up of the actual, as well as the, I guess, the forecast spend for, for 2023. Um, we will do the same for, for water when we bring in the, uh, the next PBR at the conclusion of uh, 2026. Um, and, and just, you know, going back to the, uh, um, the, the comment earlier, so, you know, as, as part of developing the PBR forecasts, we, we uh, you know, develop our forecasts on a project base, basis bottom up. Um, but so not only are we managing individual projects, um, we're also looking at the overall uh, uh, envelope of, of capital funding. And, you know, the, the examples that I provided on the, on the drainage side is, is uh, you know, sometimes costs are going to come in higher than, than forecasts. And what we're trying to do is, um, you know, assess if costs are going to come in higher on a certain project, is there an opportunity to offset that or, or defer something else? So, you know, recognizing that, uh, um, you know, we can't have all projects come in higher. Um, there needs to be an offset. Otherwise, that does impact customer rates. Um, so I think there's a managing that needs to happen both at an individual level as well as on an overall uh, capital basis. And, and one of the things I, I talked about earlier on, um, and I think that the last time we were at Utility Committee, was that uh, you know, one of the benefits of, of, of integrating water and drainage is that we can look at the capital on an overall basis and uh, assess priority and, and shift uh, as needed. Were we going to match up the PBR filing periods of all three? That is our plan. Yes. Yeah. And and so what would that what what does that look like? When do they when do they take on the same? So what period? we would need to do is we're, we're, we're going to come back with a three year filing for drainage and wastewater. We need to extend water by one year, and then that would give an give us an opportunity to bring all three back together um, uh, at the same time. So that would give them all a. A 2027 date is that right? Correct. So when you bring water back, then that would, presuming and I, not to presume anything, but presuming that that's all approved, there would would there be a a true up or a reconciliation of the capital plan, like a fairly detailed. Uh, Correct. And as we've done in in past uh, PBR applications, we have uh, provided uh, um, variance explanations for uh, you know where, where the capital exceeded certain thresholds through our post-implementation reviews, and so that would be you know, subject to review from the uh, utility committee in terms of the you know, assessment or the impact on our, our, our rate filing. Uh, you mentioned one of the reasons that we've had these, these shifts in capital spends and reprioritization. One is, is, um, is inflation and, and uh, the cost of borrowing. I think I understood you to say that. Maybe I shouldn't presume. That, that was one of the reasons. That's correct. You also said that COVID had an impact on some of the capital planning. Can you can you be more specific and just what uh, you know how the pandemic affected our so, capital planning? Yeah. So uh, I, I'd have to uh, come back with a list of projects that were specifically impacted. Oh, oh, oh. Craig will uh, uh, assist me here. I guess I'm just curious, like just how did COVID so affect those in, Inflation is, is one, is supply one. chain delays is another. Sure. Um, and so those, you know, manifested in terms of overall cost and timing. Um, Craig can uh, or, uh, likely speak to some specific examples. Yeah, good morning. Just Craig Bonivon, the Director of Engineering and Technical Services. So particularly at the treatment plants, we purposely uh, delayed lots of our capital program in order to protect workers, contract workers and our employees because we implementation of the capital program and the plants were tight were tight in those facilities and we couldn't have all of our capital going on at that time. So we deliberately slowed the pace and that resulted in a bunch spilling over into this current PBR period and, and we're still to a degree catching it back up. So again. people working in close quarters kind of a yes. question. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that's it for me for the moment. Uh, Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you very much, and thank you for the the very clear report. Um, certainly, a lot to celebrate, and a lot of uh, great successes reflected in it. I did want to. Yeah, I've got a number of questions. Um, so I noted in the report it did speak about customer consumption increase. So sort of the hot summers and working from home. Um, so it led to higher consumption than expected, and yet when we're looking at the the performance ratings for. Uh, 
um, residential con water conservation, we were still getting partial points, I guess. And so just wanted to, those just seem at odds to me that we're seeing this significant increase in water consumption and yet also seem to be scoring, scoring reasonably well on consumption reduction targets. Of course, yeah. So I think I think in terms of um, page fifty three has has the um, operational performance for water services, uh, and it's it's factor uh, four point one in terms of the cubic uh, meters per month per household. So the target was uh, sixteen point eight. Well, anyway, I'm a little confused how that all. Oh yeah, points earned five point seven. Um, so anyway, just some thoughts on on that target in particular, and what what approaches uh, will be taken to reduce consumption. Yeah. Forward. So, councillor, to a degree, many of these performance metrics, the benchmark is based on historical uh, data, and in many cases, a ten-year view back on the data. And and as has been reported to utility committee many times, our per capita consumption continues to decrease virtually offsetting the increase in population growth. So to a degree the target is likely, if you will, inflated because it's taking into account consumption patterns 10 years ago because it's a 10 year historical view. Year over year per capita consumption does fluctuate a little bit depending on uh, the type of uh, weather we have because so much of the summer consumption of course is driven by uh, weather and lawn watering and, and that sort of thing. So you will see a little bit of, if you only take the one year view, a little bit of discrepancy. If we were to have shown a longer view of it, I think you'd see the pattern still remains of declining per capita water consumption over time. Okay, and, and do you feel that we are uh, being aggressive enough in terms of some of the more proactive water consumption programs? Um, are there other, other jurisdictions that are looking at that in a different way? Um, we, we are still, um, I think, doing engagement on and messaging on consumption. Um, but to be honest, I think a lot of the gains are being had through improvements in plumbing fixtures and losses in the system, new, new builds, and improvements in, in older housing that is doing it. And um, lots of jurisdictions are seeing that the, the declining consumption is continuing, whether they have robust programs or not. Maybe Susan can speak a bit more. Yeah, so the other aspect I would add, uh, it's Suzanne, so, uh, Director One Water Planning. Um, the other aspect I would put with our water conservation programs, I think we're at the point with our rates and other stuff is to start thinking about, um, it's not blanket water conservation, it's probably more targeted conservation programs for certain customer classes that are perhaps struggling with their bills. And so that is sort of the, the aspects that we are looking at right now and some of the more detailed analytics that we're doing is, is really segmenting it a little, a, a little bit more rather than a, a generic one that's focused on lawn watering, which is really a very specific type of ho house right. uh, that is being messaged with our, our current rate structure. Okay, okay, really appreciate it and appreciate the ongoing work. Um, and yeah, those bigger systemic fixes uh, are very exciting to hear about instead of relying on just sort of that individual behavioral change. I'll start this question, but I think we'll need to come back. Well, we'll just come back. Thank, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, and I, I also have a fair number of questions, um, but thanks so much for really detailed report. Uh, I'll, I'll just start with some questions around um, green infrastructure. So in the report, it mentions that um, we have a total of 30, I think 36.9 hectares of green infrastructure, um, and that you've successfully implemented uh, low impact development at 82 locations, um, which is great. And I guess I'm just wondering, do you set LID targets uh, for each PBR period? Um, do we have long-term targets for area of, um, of LID established as part of the city plan? Are we on track to meet those targets? 
Uh, thank you, Councillor Salvador. Um, so the, in the PBR, the green hectares target actually is increasing each year. So for this year, our target is, I believe, 90 green hectares, and then next year it's 180. Um, I will be honest, it is very challenging uh, to, to get them in, and we've been lagging a little bit behind our target each year, but we're learning more with each time. Um, some of it is it's a completely new infrastructure for us, and so having to work through uh, design standards, conflicts with other utilities, understanding winter performance has been a bigger issue uh, than we anticipated when we set our, our strategy initially. But I will say that ourselves and the city departments are working very well uh, and moving it forward. And we have a separate committee underway with the development community right now, looking at how to improve it um, to get it installed. And we have, I think, four greenfield developments that are looking to see if they go fairly large with the green infrastructure installed, can that reduce the size of pipes and, and ponds going forward? So it's, it's a very positive dialogue. Uh, but I will admit this target is very challenging for us. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for that answer. And um, just thinking about some of those those challenges, um, I guess if if we aren't progressing as quickly as as we'd necessarily like, or or we're uh, sort of struggling to grasp those targets, do we know? Are there any policy or funding gaps that need to be addressed? Uh, what can we do to ensure we are we're meeting those? I think for us right now is um, as we're working through our modernization of our design standards, that's our primary thing. We're, we're trying to eliminate where each one has to be a unique design. Can it be as easy to pick out as a catch basin to install? That's that's my, my big goal uh, for this that we're working towards. So at this point, I don't think there's any policy direction items uh, related to it. We are working towards it. Um, some of it um, we also want to look at potentially with the na next rates filing. Um, right now, we, the way we fund it is either we fully fund or the customer fully funds. Is there a potential to introduce a, some sort of a subsidy program to help incent, similar to what we have with the backwater valves? And mm -hmm. so we want to look at that. Other communities have implemented similar programs, and so we're looking at that potentially for the next PBR, and we think that might help. Uh, especially when it comes to working with the commercial customers who have a much shorter um, time frame on their cost benefit analysis that uh, they require something to just boost it uh, forward. Okay, that's um, really exciting to hear. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and then maybe a little bit of time left, I'll, I'll jump to something completely different. Um, <laughs> I have some questions about the Network Private Development Transmission Mains program. Um, so my understanding is that this program is supposed to be uh, a reimbursement program where we pay developers back uh, for work they do when they're meeting uh, the specifications that are, that are required for extending transmission mains. Um, I guess just in terms of, of mechanics, I'm trying to understand how, how this would work. So uh, for example, you know, a developer is building a transmission main to, to Ellerslie uh, to service the area that, that they're developing. Is it correct to understand that EPCOR would uh, then come in and say, you know, well, we're expecting that beyond your particular development, uh, there is going to be additional demand for the surrounding, surrounding subdivisions and areas, areas, so we'd like you to build a larger main. First, I'll pause there, is that correct? Uh, yes, it's correct. So through the area and neighborhood structure plans, that come through, there's a hydraulic network analysis that is completed that's reviewed by EPCOR to confirm the sizing of the transmission network. Uh, we look at the consumption forecast, the, the customer expectations, um, and then also we review the designs that come through and we review the tender packages that come in uh, before we would reimburse. So okay. reimbursement occurs after construction is complete. Okay, I will pick up right where I'm leaving off. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Great, thank you very much. Um, just remind me, this is our first progress report since the term was set. Is that correct? For this PBR term, for, correct. Right, for this. Correct. And generally, we have one progress report per per term. Is that right? Annually. A oh, annually. Okay. Um, I was wondering, I guess I'll start with some specific questions about 
uh, the attachment one on the capital expenditure side, uh, this is page 46 in the report. Um, it indicated that the dry pump program received seven million less than expected from grants. Um, the SIRP dry pump program received also 4.6 less than expected from grants. Um, So I guess, and, and, um, and then there's another one also less in, you know, 4.9 million less in grant. So I just wanted to confirm that you received a total of 16.5 million less in grants. And what grants are those? And do you have any information on why you didn't receive as much as you were anticipating? So what a, it, it's a timing thing actually. We will get the grants. Oh. It, they come in when the construction's complete. And so because the projects have been delayed, the grant uh, money hasn't come in at the same time. So the total grant uh, envelope that we have for dry ponds uh, from the DMAP programs as well as the Alberta government uh, grant program, both of those grants are expected to come through. When the construction um, is done. It's just the timing. Of, it, it's, a, it's a timing thing. So when the pond is complete, we get the grant. And so will that then be reflected in the true yes. up or adjusted when you come back? Okay. <laughs> One other aspect I will add on the Malcolm Tweddle uh, Pond project, which is the NP NB NBCF grant, uh, which was the city obtained before the, the transition to Edmonton, because we were able to complete that project at less cost than what was originally forecast, we just got uh, approval from the federal government to repurpose the unused portion of that grant into additional pond work in that basin. Uh, and so the federal government's been very helpful with us in making sure that we get our full grant allotment that's been awarded over time. And this is the NBCF with the federal government. What does that stand for? Uh, national, oh. I don't know, actually. Okay. <laughs> something <laughs> something related it's to It's an older drainage. grant. From okay. The, from, it was 2016, I think, is when it was awarded to the city. So. Okay. And... Um, and then you do, I mean, you do have plans already then to yeah. how to allocate that in the same, in the same in the basin? Same, in the same basin, yes. By Malcolm Tweddle. By Malcolm Tweddle. So we're going to oh. uh, extend the Smart Pond program for the dry ponds in that basin, as well as some additional low impact development construction oh. in that basin. Okay, that's, that's good to hear that there will be some continued work going on there. Um, and then you said there's also the, the provincial government one kind of the same thing, but got it. Um, thank you for uh, that kind of explainer I, uh, on the consumption deferral. I think I understood better when you explained it than when I read it. But I guess I just want to clarify a few things uh, just to clarify my, my, my understanding of how that works. Um, so when you say it's going to be refunded back to customers in the next term, is that going to be, do you mean it's going to be reflected in their monthly bill or is that going to be factored in? to offset the PBR calculation for the next term? And um, I guess, what can we anticipate for, for next term if all things held equal, no delays and, and whatnot, no pandemic? Uh, are, like, you know, does that mean lower rate in general? So, Councillor Tang, so at, at this point in time, so the, um, to answer the first part of your question, so yes, it will be, ref the refund will be reflected in their rates. Uh, uh, when we come back for approval for rates in the next PBR term. Um, and so one of the things is, uh, you know, this is the first year of the deferral uh, account, and so we'll have to see what happens in 2023 and 2024 as it accumulates, and, you know, the, the, the net impact of that would, would be refunded to customers. So for 2023, we've had a, uh, you know, a similar weather, weather pattern as, as we did for 2022. It's been hot and dry. At least it was hot and dry um, earlier this year, and so uh, I expect the deferral account to be similar in 2023 uh, as, as 2022. Um, and uh, it w if it continues in in that uh, pattern, then it will result in a lower rate for customers. Okay, great, thank you. And just want to check my audio. It, does this sound better for the people online? Yes, it does. Thank, Thank you. you. It's my mic. Yeah, that's a lot better. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the uh, presentation and all the good information here. So my first question is about the drainage system. Uh, 
based on the presentation um, in 2022, the drainage system uh, capital expenditure increased almost $10 million. Um, for the following years, to 2024, keep increase. So can you can you specific where those increase will be reflected in the residential drainage system improve, improvement or commercial or non-residential? And can you be more specific? Just give me a second to find the page. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, so on page uh, 40 and 41 of the report, we talk about um, some of the different uh, increases that occurred. Um, oh, sorry, no, that was the, the operating budget. Sorry, uh, page 46. Um, and so in terms of the increases, of, of 10 million of that was related to outfall rehab. Um, so in 2021, uh, the spring breakup that we had that year in the River Valley, uh, I think we had almost 70 um, outfalls that were damaged. Uh, during that period due to the, the way the ice has scoured the river valley. So we had some additional capital we needed to spend on outfall rehab. Uh, we have a portion that's related to our real estate consolidation project, which was somewhere on the water side tied to the timing and, and the rescoping of that. Um, and then the other one is, is really on the, um, the, core, the core order and reduction uh, project. As we've been installing the access manholes into the trunk network, we're okay. finding yeah, so I, I, more... I, I, Sorry, I have to jump here because I have my, yep. my form of time. Uh, I, I, I know those details, but my question is about the is there any plan to improve the drainage system uh, we heard the council and from certain residential areas. Um, and we heard lots of uh, complaint and feedback from residential area regarding the drainage system and the cost, the flood and when the snow melting and cause the flood uh, when the uh, heavy rain come in. So I just wondering those increase will refract to improve this type of situation and in the res residential area. Yeah, so in our residential area, we have a couple of different programs uh, related to, based on asset condition, we'll do uh, infrastructure improvements based on as we see blockages or failures. Uh, in terms of stormwater and rainwater flow, that's our stormwater integrated resource plan strategy that has uh, the dry ponds as well as the low impact development being installed throughout the neighborhood to um, hold back the, the rainwater and reduce it, release it slowly. Yeah, so then this is a question related to, and because due to this forecast and for the stormwater inter integrate strategy and resources plan actually is decreased significant, how does this reflect that improvement? So the, yeah, yeah so the, the decrease in the stormwater injury resource plan is primarily due to the delays in the major pond construction. The other components of the stormwater strategy are continuing to move forward. Um, and the ponds, it's just a, it's a timing delay. They're, they're fairly big projects uh, that come to come together. So we are continuing to move forward with those. Uh, I would like to follow up offline for certain questions because I have to leave soon and okay. for my temporary meeting, but I do have last questions. Uh, in terms of developer and the city contribute the funding reduced lots, uh, what is specific reason and why those contribution reduced? Yeah, on the drainage side? Yes, and the full, from developers and the city contributed. Uh, and that, that's just primarily related to the type of assets that the developers have turned over to us during uh, the period. So it's very much driven by which neighborhoods have come into service during and that. Do you have specific neighborhood related data for that? I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear your question. I said, do we have specific uh, labourhoods related to the data? Uh, that I don't have that information at hand, but we can get that for you. Okay, thank you very, ma very much. That is my question. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Stevenson. Thank you. So circling back to the questions on the deferral account from Councillor Tang. So, yeah, I was also wanting to clarify it seems that there's an opportunity to retain a fund to help smooth out any um, potential consumption decreases moving forward so that uh, customers aren't hit with a, with a larger cost later on. So 
is, is that the intent, as you were saying, to kind of smooth that out over the PDR term? Uh, I think that will be the, the outcome, um, unless, uh, you know, if the pattern continues, then it will accumulate. Um, so this is the, the first year. And so, you know, really what's happened is as a result of the uh, adoption of this, this deferral account, um, you know, prior to the adoption of the deferral account, EPCOR Water Services uh, held the, the risk, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so through the adoption of this, it, it you know, moves it onto the, the, the customers. And so that is uh, a, a, an outcome. Uh, one of the things we uh, have, have talked about internally is let's, you know, we're monitoring this, seeing where it goes. And as we come back in the next uh, um, uh, PBR application, uh, we'll have some, uh, you know, recommendations on how we should handle this. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a really interesting one and look forward to some discussion and, and creative approaches to that moving forward. Um, Circling back to capital programs, I noted that there's a deferral of drainage neighborhood renewal. Just wanted to confirm that that wouldn't impact the coordination that happens with the city's neighborhood renewal. Um, again, just to ensure that, that that renewal with those projects is being prioritized to avoid, again, tearing up uh, the same road twice. Yeah, and, and we probably could have worded that paragraph a little bit better in the report. Um, we are still coordinated with uh, the city's neighborhood program. Um, probably the, the biggest change that has occurred since the transition to EPCOR, uh, with the budget for neighborhood re renewal program sewer work, they tended to do projects to the budget. And so there were a number of sewer lines that were getting relined and replaced that were very low risk. Mm. And so as we've been starting to look at our risk framework across all of the asset categories, so for example, compared to outfalls or other aspects where we're, we're looking at it, it has to hit a certain risk threshold in order to, to qualify for coordination under the neighborhood renewal program. And that's consistent with how we approach it on the water side as well. So there was a bit of a shift of, of approach on there, but we are absolutely doing the, the assets that need to be rehabbed at the time of the neighborhood work. It, it's happening at the same time. Great, great. And what is that sort of um, level of tolerance? Is it sort of uh, infrastructure that might need to be replaced within 10 years? I could see not doing it at the time of renewal. Like what, what's the... A combination of number of customers that are impacted, mm -hmm. uh, the type of the road structure on top, the type of neighborhood renewal work that's being done. So if it's just a grind and overlay road structure, not a right. full road structure rebuild. It doesn't make sense to go in and, and spend that extra capital on a, a sewer yeah, line that risk. has 10 customers on it. Right. Um, and so it's been a bit of that sort of a assessment on it. Um, we definitely have other drainage assets that, that need the money more than those small sewer laterals. Perfect, okay, thank you, that's really helpful. Uh, and then just a, a broader question that, that sparked for me with some of the commentary around uh, the private development construction coordination. Just wondering if, if EPCOR has been looped into the city's conversations about substantial completion. Um. Absolutely, yes. I think we had 30 of us respond to the online survey okay. um, and definitely have been ha heavily engaged in that. There's a number of aspects related to complete streets in terms of how our infrastructure sits underneath mm. that asset, so it's water drainage and power. Uh, we need to think about that in terms of the alignment of how all those components are. So absolutely fully engaged. Okay, and sorry, and just for, so, so for the complete streets and then substantial completion in terms of uh, our, our patterns of growth yes. and sort of the implications of opening up the future growth area. Yes, so yeah. we've also been involved in those uh, sessions. So in December of last year, uh, we jointly held a session with the growth uh, management team okay. uh, that dealt with the standards modernization as well as uh, substantial completion. Uh, and based on the report, our feedback has been reflected in terms of, in, in particular, how the industrial and commercial areas have been reflected in substantial completion, directly reflect EPCOR's impact and input. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much. Those are all the questions I had. Really appreciate the report again. Great. Thank you. Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, so just jumping back to my previous line of questioning, um, how is the division of that reimbursement determined? Uh, is it for sort of the entirety of the main extension or is it an incremental, um, is, it, is it the incremental cost of installation? Is it, you were talking about the private development uh, sure. transmission needs? Yep. 
there's actually two <coughs> programs that apply to that. Um, so for the pipes that are 450 millimeters in diameter and larger, uh, those are paid for 100% by the utility. Then we have a sliding scale uh, between the, the 250 to the 400 millimeter side where we pay a, 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 a delta amount equivalent of it being a 250 millimeter diameter. Okay, maybe just to, to break that down a little bit further, I'm, I'm trying to understand um, if back to the scenario I, I painted earlier, you know, if a developer is uh, extending a certain distance because they are you know, developing a, a parcel of land uh, versus the requirements of FCOR to ensure that that pipe can uh, support the capacity of additional future development. Um, is the reimbursement for the entirety of that line or is it just for the portion um, that that developer would be developing? Uh, it is for the entirety of the line for the line for the pipes that are of that larger diameter and then okay. the portion on the size. Um, it's also important to note the transmission also delivers some of the fire flow requirements right. as well. And so it's a combination of not just benefiting developer growth, but also providing the fire flows that are required in the area. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, and then that leads to another question. Do we, so that's for a greenfield context. Do we have something similar for an infill context? I'm thinking about um, you know, when a larger building is proposed on a block, um, sometimes they will end up paying for that, that uh, upgrade that supports the entirety of the block. Um, I'm not, I guess I'm not sure how that differs from uh, a, a greenfield context. Um, is there a similar reimbursement in place when those block wide upgrades are being done in a mature neighborhood? For the infill system, we have our infill fire protection program. So typically on the infill, we're talking less transmission main upgrades, but more local pipe upgrades. And so the developers have the opportunity to apply for the infill fire protection program. The other aspect I would add is that through our standards modernization work, we are also identifying that we have opportunities uh, that we don't need as much infrastructure upgrade as necessary. Okay. Okay. Um, so no different program, not reimbursement based. Exactly. Okay. Uh, then I'll, thank you for those answers. Um, I'll jump to a few questions uh, around the, just the introduction of a fee-based rate structure for water services connections. Um, I've been hearing a little bit of rumbling about this from, uh, from constituents and, and industry members as well. Um, so I understand that there's a fee-based rate structure for new infill service connections. Um, and we've moved from a fixed fee to a uh, cost for service structure. Am I correct in understanding that that is under the water services connections program or is that something else? Uh, yes, it is under the water services connections program. Okay. Um, and yes, we have shifted to an approach where we're based on the actual cost of a water service or sewer service construction to a property. Okay. okay, and how, I know that that's a fairly recent switch. Uh, how has that been going? Like what, what type of feedback um, have you been hearing? I have, I'm probably hearing some outlier cases, but I've heard some pretty extreme escalations and differences in the flat fee versus um, the fee for service. What are, what are you folks hearing? Okay, I'm, I'm not directly involved in the program, so we can get you additional information on that. Sure. Um, that would be really helpful. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, I would, I would love some additional information um, just around how, how that implementation is rolling out um, and how that's, how that's differing from the flat fee um, and just around you know, the predictability of the flat fee versus the cost recovery of um, the fee-for-service model. Uh, great, so I'll, uh, I'll leave it there with a few seconds left, but would really appreciate getting that information um, offline would be great. Thanks. Yeah, will do. Thank you, uh, Councillor Tang. Great, thank you. Um, if you can actually share that information with, with all of us, I, I have some exam, or not examples, some concerns around um, steep escalation. Um, I just have a couple of remaining questions and then uh, just wanna, to make sure I didn't miss this, but did you say that the performance standards for the operational performance comes from the 10-year trend earlier, or is that for something different? 
lot of the, the benchmarks that you see there were, are based on historical uh, averages, if you will. Okay, yes. I was wondering where those numbers came there, from. There so is more, I don't think it has, each metric is slightly unique in its calculation. I don't think all the details are in the performance report, but generally speaking, they're based on historical. On data that we have, not yes. necessarily yeah. Previously from. Previously yeah. reported annually in the performance reports, yes. And Great. include in the PBR filings as well. Great, um, and I have a question for uh, Mr. Beckett. Um, appreciate the caution uh, that you had, you know, mentioned. I guess when I was reading this, the thought, you know, not being a very technical person, one of the things I was curious about is how did this progress report align with, and I don't even know what the right, right word is, you know, the principles or some of the, you know, the concept that went into determining the, the term, you know, a few years back? Do you feel that this, you know, barring some of the challenges mentioned around the delay, around COVID and all of that, um, do you think by and large this progress re report reflect kind of the intent that was started at the beginning? Yes, absolutely. Okay, can you elaborate? Well, when you um, look at um, the existing PBR, uh, and then the variances that have occurred over the course of the year, that's definitely food for thought for the next PBR. And that's exactly what we're getting here. So uh, I certainly think that it's, it's serving its purpose. Great, great to hear. Thank you so much. Um, you know, at this time, um, Mr. Chair, if I may, I'll put the motion on the floor that the September 5th, 2023 EPCOR Water Services Incorporated Report EXT02000 be received for information. Uh, thank you. However, I understood there was no. another motion in the works. Okay, motion on the floor then. Uh, any further questions, Councillor Chan? Well, Councillor Stevenson? Hi, I was just wondering if our administration could come up um, uh, just for a few questions to follow up on the, the substantial completion discussion. Just give you a moment to, to come up. Uh, thank you so much. Um, just wanted to, to dig into that question of substantial completion, which we, we discussed at length last week. Um, I'm just reflecting on the fact that, that EPCOR's capital planning has a, you know, is significantly impacted on our growth patterns. And just wondering if the question had been explored in terms of the impact to, to rate payers uh, and their, their capital program. Uh, you know, for example, if we open up the future growth area, at what stage uh, based on the completion of other areas of the city? Certainly, Councillor. Um, so that specific question hasn't been explored in the first um, segment of our engagement, but it's certainly something that we can explore as now we start to develop those targets, those thresholds for each of the districts. Mm -hmm. We can certainly be working with EPCOR to understand what impact that may have on their capital program and consider also the future growth area and what, it, what kind of considerations they may have to have in place for the capital planning of the future growth area as well. I'll also mention as part of the um, work we'll be doing on a technical servicing study, certainly EPCOR would be involved in that, um, understanding what are the technical requirements for infrastructure for the future growth area. Great, thank you, I really appreciate that. And I think having an understanding on both sides in the sense that maybe there are cost advantages to continuing the infrastructure down into the future growth area versus starting in new areas, but, but I also wonder how much is already built in the new areas that would just be underutilized uh, with, with substantial completion. Did you require any further direction on that or that's just a part of the ongoing conversations? No, I think we can do that as part of the next uh, bit of engagement that we'll be doing here over the next few months. So I think we're Awesome, good. awesome, that's great. Thank you so much, really appreciate it. No further questions. Thank you, I don't see any other questions then. The one's uh, queued up, so uh, we have a motion on the floor. Uh, anyone like to speak to the motion? Okay, Councillor Tang to close. 
Not much, but just uh, thank you very much for this report, and I look forward to the next one. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you. Please vote. We have all the vote. Please display the vote. And that is carried. Great, thank you. Thank you for the presentation and the discussion. That takes us now to item 7.2. Uh, 25 to 27 performance-based regulation rate application, uh, the public engagement and awareness plan. Morning, councillors. I'm Robert Moyles. I'm the senior manager of public and community engagement with EPCOR, and uh, happy to take any feedback. We don't have a presentation today on this report. Is I'm sorry. Is there a presentation or no? No. There is no presentation. No, no presentation. I'm sorry. Okay. I, my mistake. Uh, so, uh, councillor Stevenson, then. Yeah. Thank you so much. Really appreciated having the chance to to review. Um, a few questions were raised for me. So I was thinking, again, I think it's acknowledged in the report that this is a very technical exercise. Um, you know, engagement will, will have some challenges and barriers just based on that. I know in previous uh, uh, undertakings that the city has done, for example, around energy transition, they have had more focused um, groups that, that are sort of brought along in the process who, who receive additional education um, and and sort of yeah training and, and skills development to help them be participants in the process. Is that something that's been considered here or are we still looking at you know sort of a broad public public outreach? We've, uh, we've looked at more of a broad public outreach, but with a specific uh, reference to people who are more intimately involved with certain issues in terms of um, stormwater rates uh, and people who have um, special interests, I guess, in that in terms of cemeteries, golf courses, you know, perhaps other uh, groups that probably have a little bit higher awareness or knowledge already. Those are the groups that we would probably take a deeper dive with on some of these issues. And how, how would this compare to the engagement that was done on the last uh, PDR? Is it going to be a similar level of involvement or is this a new, a new strategy and approach? Um, the approach will take will be similar. The last one was water, so it uh, was a bit more uh, broad and I guess had perhaps a little bit of a broader public interest. But the approach is similar in terms of us uh, attempting to ascertain values of people and aligning up the application with those values. So for example, how people would prioritize environmental work over uh, other kinds of aspects, rates, and other things that are part of the application, rather than very specific questions about dollar amounts and things like that. It's, a, it's more of an approach that seeks to understand preferences um, for and priorities for um, different aspects of the application and different aspects of how and where we would invest or prioritize, rather than be very specific about particular parts of the application, right. with the exception of those groups that I mentioned earlier that would have a specific knowledge or interest or right. uh, yeah, understanding. Yeah, no, that seems like a really a really great approach, kind of looking at those those broad community values and, and how they balance trade-offs for sure. And then will we have, so I my memory is that we have a series of discussion papers that will be coming to, to utility committee. Will there be an opportunity to um, have some of the community feedback sort of based on each of each of those as we go along, or are we looking more at just sort of a final what we heard report at the end? We're, we'll do our best. There's a bit of a balancing act that we're mm -hmm. that we're undertaking with in terms of timing. Uh, a lot of it will come more at the end, uh, and the approach is probably to hear direction from utility committee uh, and what you're hearing. Uh, from right. your constituents and trying to incorporate that uh, uh, first as much as possible. Then we'll have to look at um, how much time we have left uh, in between putting the application together and bringing it forward to gather some of that information and reflect it back. But we, it will likely be reflected more in the final documents that come forward than rather at any of the earlier stages. Okay, okay, great, thank you. Those are all the questions I had. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Great, thank you very much. Um, pretty straightforward for information. Uh, 
And I've noted that you, in the report is said that the engagement approach mirrors kind of the city of Edmonton, and, and this is at a refined level. Can you just clarify for me why? I mean, refine is fairly later on in the engagement process. I'm just curious why that's your starting point. Why not, let's say, some of the earlier stages, say, advise? Well, I think refine reflects the fact that there's a, a fairly significant amount of information that's already developed or, or parameters that are already in place. That was in place without sort of public input and that kind of stuff, right? Well, based on the previous PVRs, based on previous council direction, based on the requirements of, of funding and applications. So um, advice tends to be closer to starting from scratch, and we're not typically starting from scratch right. with these kind of applications. Does that help? Yeah, and I guess, you know, I mean, there's a few other stages in between, but you're kind of jumping all the way to sort of that final... Um, or in, in, you know, in the city of Edmonton spectrum, kind of that final stage of really just refining the, the bits and pieces is often how I interpret you know, that, that spectrum of public engagement. I can appreciate that you know, a lot of this is technical. There's a lot of precedence um, you know, based on previous round. Um, I guess I was just curious because that's not typically how you know, cities' public engagement start. Yeah, I, I, I do think it's it's a result of the fact that a lot of this is already either in place or determined, and, and at this, not, I shouldn't say that, it, a lot of what we, there are a lot of parameters that are, uh, uh, are, are perhaps more fixed, or we'll take the feedback from what we hear from utility committee based on your feedback from constituents sure. as well to refine rather than go out and, and say, here's a blank slate, or yeah. at some of the earlier engagement stages, which might be more. Yeah, but I mean, I will just say, like, it's a fairly extensive plan, and I think it's looking good, um, but the expectation is that we're not looking at overhauling any really components, really just small adjustments. So I feel like that managing expectation, uh, especially with when it comes to public input, would be pretty critical. Um, I'm, I'm also wondering then, just if I can clarify the, the timeline. So engagement will start in Q4 of this year. And then starting in 2024, th the discussion papers will be released. And the equity one will be released earlier on, right, to inform engagement that will then wrap up in Q1 2024. Is that, the cor like, is that timeline understanding correct? Yeah, it's... Uh aggressive schedule, um, you know, given the fact that we're, uh, you know, planning to bring our application to utility committee by, uh, in, in Q2. Um, so, you know, feedback that we can uh, incorporate, as, as uh, mentioned earlier, from, you know, the discussion papers, the feedback at utility committee, um, you know, we'll endeavor to incorporate that in our application. Right. And, but it just sounds like there's a bit of a feedback loop between the discussion papers and the engagement activities. Yeah, we, we don't have a specific date for the uh, um, the uh, the equity paper to come back to utility committee. My understanding is uh, in October we'll have finalized the uh, the city of Edmonton will have finalized the dates for the 2024 utility committee meetings. But you know in the meantime we will be um, you know w working on those papers in in advance and uh, working with our public and, and government affairs team to. Um, figure out how we're going to get the uh, consultation done on those uh, those matters as well. Okay. So I just wanted to clarify so, yeah, that it'll, understanding. It'll be a bit of a, a balancing act to get everything coordinated and completed right. in Q1. Okay. Well, I look forward to seeing that. Um, and then just finally, uh, you've identified some really key stakeholders, definitely. Um, wondering how you would ensure coverage across the city, and are you thinking of holding, like, specific conversations or workshops or, and whatnot in different wards or different district? Uh, we are considering how to best reach those stakeholders, likely not based on the geographic breakdowns, okay. uh, but we do want to get a uh, overall view of, of um, preferences and values of the, the entire citizens, citizens of Edmonton. And so to the degree that we can gather that information, get robust data enough 
we'll be able to drill that down geographically, sure. perhaps, and break it down by preference. I guess just in, you know, in thinking about equity, and I remember last meeting, you know, there's maps presented. There is a geographic component. Um, so just want to flag that, and I think if there are specific sessions in ward or in districts, um, I, for one, will be happy to come get the word out and support as much as I can. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you. Just a, a couple of quick ones. Uh, so in rate structure and design, understanding public and consumer views on the cost and benefit trade-offs and so on, um, one would assume that the answer that customers will give is that they just want to pay less. They don't want rates to go up. So I'm just curious how you approach this question with the public. Yeah, and the approach we've taken last time and, and, and would take again is to try to ascertain a sense of values and how much weight people would put on uh, the idea of uh, cost versus other kinds of priorities. So cost would be one, one value versus environmental protection versus reliability versus uh, reinvestment in the system to make sure it's, it's maintained. So it's rather a reflection of, of values uh, rather than actual you know, would you pay 10 cents more to, to get this? So that's how we try to uh, analyze it. Um, if, if I might, there's a famous story of a researcher who asked mothers what breakfast cereal they would buy for their children, and it was, they all said, the most nutritious one. Then, of course, when they watched them in the aisles, they all took the one that the kid was screaming for when they had them in their cart. So it's a question of trying to ascertain what people's preferences are based not on necessarily on what they will tell you, but on, on how they would uh, respond to a variety of questions and observations about uh, their particular preferences for, um, you know, behind the scenes, so to speak. Okay, interesting. I'll highlight that. I, I'm very interested in the follow-up. Okay. Um, yeah, because that might be challenging uh, in this age of inflation. Everyone's bills going up, so we'll see how that behavior changes. Okay, uh, the next question is down to developer funding. Um, a more consistent framework for allocating the cost of development between developers and repairs. Can you talk about why? So basically the question that comes to my mind is, oh, okay, do we not have a consistent framework? I think the intent of uh, this paper here is to investigate that as well as understand what's happening in, in other jurisdictions and is there something that we need to, uh, to, to change in, in, in uh, our methodology. Um, so there's no, um, I guess, conclusions to be uh, drawn from, from that yet. Um, you know, we'll uh, uh, explore and investigate this and, and then uh, report back to utility committee. Okay, just going to follow up on it. It's just that the way that it's phrased, it's different approaches for a more consistent framework for allocating costs of development between developers and ratepayers. The very nature of the statement indicates that there is not a consistent framework. So, Councillor Paquette, I think that's referring to there are some differences on the water side versus the drainage side. Um, it may be appropriate for those differences to to exist, um, but that's that's something that we're going to investigate. So that's that's the differences that uh, that statement is referring to. Okay, um, fair, but I will note that we are starting in that statement from a perspective that it is not consistent. So just FYI, I'll be watching that one as well. Okay, um, that's it for this item. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Uh, no one else is on the board. Would you care to move receipt of information? Yes, yeah, so moved. Thank you. Uh, anyone to speak to the motion? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I've neglected one item. I, I just want to check with Mr. Beckett. I don't, this isn't really a regulatory thing, but I just want to make sure he had any comments. No comments. Great. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Stevenson. Yeah, just briefly to say, uh, you know, really look forward to the process ahead. Uh, this, this, you know, I see the challenge of this work, but appreciate the approach you've taken with the values base and, and look forward to having some of those more detailed conversations as we go through uh, the process. Thank you. Thank you. Please vote.
We have other votes. Please display the vote. That is carried. Thank you. Thanks very much for uh, the conversation today. That takes us to item 7.3, Edmonton Water Treatment and Plants Flood Mitigation Project. Good morning. Good morning, committee. Well, we're here today to provide information and recommend that committee pr approve the environmental impact assessment and that the location of the flood mitigation barriers within the River Valley be deemed essential pursuant to bylaw 7188, North Saskatchewan River Valley Area Redevelopment Plan. Joining me today is Hawaii Hassan, Director of Urban Growth and Open Space. Audrey Kudrak, Director, Treat Water Treatment Plants with EPCOR. Additionally, we have a number of City of Edmonton and EPCOR representatives that are available to help answer questions uh, that committee may have. I'll now ask Audrey to uh, start off our presentation. All right, thank you very much, Kent. Uh, slide two, please. Over the next 30 years, Climate change modeling predicts that extreme weather will be more frequent. For the North Saskatchewan River, this is expected to lead to higher flows in the winter and spring and greater unpredictability overall. Both of Edmonton's water treatment plants, E.L. Smith and Rossdale, are situated in the North Saskatchewan River floodplain. These two water treatment plants are critical, not only to Edmonton, but also to the 90 plus communities and 1.3 million Albertans that depend on them. We have about two days of reservoir storage available and a major flood could prevent EPCOR from producing drinking water for much longer than two days. Flood recovery requires power and clean water. If we protect critical infrastructure, it contributes to the socioeconomic security of the region and emergency resources can support community recovery. Slide three, please. While river water quality and river flow is expected to change due to increased extreme weather events and climate change, we have a plan to successfully manage the impact of these changes. To ensure that we can continue to serve the 1.3 million people who count on us for their drinking water, we are undertaking a project to lessen the chance of catastrophic damage to our treatment plants during a North Saskatchewan River flood and to help us resume potable water treatment as quickly as possible after a flood. The Edmonton Water Treatment Plant's flood mitigation project will protect our drinking water supply by installing physical flood barriers to protect water treatment equipment, by preventing river water from backing up into the plants by installing floodgates into our existing plant drainage pipes that discharge to the river, and increasing protection to critical assets like pumps and reservoirs. From 2024 to 2028, we plan to construct flood barriers that include a combination of grass-covered embankments and flood walls, both topped with security fencing. The project is supported by $22 million in federal and provincial government funding. Next slide, please. Over the past three years, while planning for this work, we have sought input from community members, special interest groups, residents, recreational user groups, and neighboring community leagues to understand how best to integrate the flood barriers into locations around the plant. EPCOR also engaged representatives of more than 30 indigenous nations and communities, building relationships and gathering feedback through community meetings, pipe ceremonies, walking tours, and special working groups. EPCOR will continue these conversations throughout the project. Our key commitments include to not worsen flooding in surrounding neighborhoods, to remain ecological re ecologically responsible, and to celebrate the history of the area and to consider space to support recreation and community gathering. I'll now, I'll now turn the presentation over to Huweda Hassan to provide an overview of the environmental review process undertaken by the city with respect to this project. The rest of this presentation will focus on the site location study, 
the SLS, sorry, next slide please, and the Environmental Impact Assessment or the EIA for this project as required by the North Saskatchewan River Valley Area Redevelopment Plan. The Area Redevelopment Plan requires that Council review and approve the EIA and SLS and deem the project essential. This is because portions of the land impacted by the project fall under city ownership. Both an SLS and EIA are sub were submitted to support this project. Next slide. The purpose of the site location study as defined in the Area Redevelopment Plan is to review multiple locations and options for a project with respect to the costs and social, environmental and institutional constraints which make a River Valley location essential. With respect to this project, two alternatives were reviewed. The first considered a no mitigation option and this was not recommended as it left critical water infrastructure subject to flooding. Another alternative was to keep the mitigation fully within EPCOR's land was also reviewed. This wasn't pursued as it would have required the removal of the existing buildings and associated disruption to drinking water supply for Edmontonians. Impacts were identified with the proposed location, however these impacts were outweighed by the benefits of increasing the resilience of the critical infrastructure to flooding. It is not possible to achieve this without locating the mitigation within the river valley as this is where the flood risk occurs. Next slide. The EIA identified multiple impacts associated with the design, construction and ongoing maintenance of the flood mitigation work. During review, mitigation measures were identified and recommended to reduce the preliminary impacts. The removal of vegetation will affect the role of this area for wildlife habitat and as a wildlife corridor and require mitigation. Risks associated with increased erosion and sedimentation and with negative impacts to viewscapes have also been identified and determined not to require dedicated mitigation. Recommended mitigation measures included pushing the flood mitigation barrier towards EPCOR's property to avoid impacts along the natural area, using flood walls rather than the embankments along the environmentally sensitive locations to minimize tree removals. This is because earth and embankments require extended areas with root-free zones compared to flood walls. Renaturalization of the E.L. Smith location along the degraded riparian corridor by the lower pump house. As well at both locations, EPCOR proposes to implement a long-term vegetation management plan to improve the ecological function within their property. EPCOR's stated goal with this plan is to restore vegetation and wildlife habitat areas to its sites that are large, larger than the areas removed for the barriers. EPCOR will increase vegetation area within its fence line and provide additional habitat for birds, insects and small woodland creatures um, than currently exist. EPCOR is also working with the city on how and where to add trees and vegetation on city land outside EPCOR's fence lines. Next slide. A total of up to 557 trees are anticipated to be removed as a result of this project. 77 of these were considered mature trees and the remainder are smaller trees and saplings. The maps show the location of the barriers and the maintenance zones where vegetation will be limited in order to ensure the integrity of the barriers and the ability to maintain them on an ongoing basis. The maps also show where both E.L. Smith and Rossdale, um, also show areas, sorry, at both E.L. Smith and Rossdale to be included for renaturalization as part of the long-term vegetation management plan. Next slide. At this time, we're pleased to take questions the committee may have. Great, thank you. Uh, we will now hear from our speaker. I don't think there's any need to move of our speakers online, so we'll uh, just go that way. Suit yourself. Uh, so uh, we'll, our speaker is uh, Christine Kowalczuk from the Edmonton River Valley Conservation Coalition. Uh, Ms. Kowalczuk, you've been here before. Five minutes. Uh, please watch the timer online. And afterwards, uh, committee members may have some questions for you. Thanks for being okay, here. Okay, thank morning. you. Thank you very much. Good morning. The Edmonton River Valley Conservation Coalition would like to express our concerns regarding EPCOR's flood mitigation plans, and we urge you to not approve the project or changes to the River Valley bylaw. Our concerns regarding the project include the plan to cut down 577 trees in the River Valley, including 77 mature trees. Even if young trees are replanted, they do not replace mature trees. Mature trees offer exponentially greater ecosystem services, such as carbon sequestration, flood and drought mitigation, and habitat. Some of the areas will be cut, kept cut forevermore as a root free maintenance zone replaced by long covered walls with security fencing on top. Restoration in other areas is only proposed in EPCOR's report rather than committed to. Um, we're also concerned about the impact of the project on the wildlife corridor, in particular in pinch points that are already in desperate need of restoration. 
Um, we question the wisdom of trying to hold back the river in a floodplain, and we question um, the, the lack of a long-term plan to decentralize water treatment rather than continuing to cause reliance of so many communities, over 90 communities, on just two water treatment plants um, that are furthermore located in these floodplains. ERVCC has expressed these concerns to EPCOR in multiple meetings, yet our concerns are not reflected in the What We Heard document. EPCOR's approach with this project reflects tunnel vision and seems based on various dangerous assumptions. In a recent meeting, for example, we heard EPCOR say that this project is about balancing protection of the water treatment plants and stewardship of the river valley. We disagree. Instead, we see a single goal, to protect our drinking water through protecting the resilience of the river valley. As Calgary and High River learned 10 years ago, water will do what it wants. And cities around the world, from the Netherlands to China, have learned the hard way that concrete berms, walls, and barriers are mistakes. As a 2022 article in The Guardian on slow water states, Con concrete infrastructure designed to control water not only fails, it makes matters worse. Because what is needed is permeable floodplains. Um, as they say, sooner or later, water always wins. In the Netherlands and the UK, dikes and berms are now being removed to prevent extreme flooding. These cities have found that working with rather than against nature is far more effective at protecting against floods. A main approach by the cities above is to instead create floodplain parks that allow for absorption of water in that landscape. In Edmonton, this would mean rewilding Rossdale and E.L. Smith as wildlife habitat and as parks so that there is minimal infrastructure and healthy soil and vegetation that it can absorb water in a flood event. This slow water approach is cost efficient, protects wildlife corridors, protects vegetation that holds up banks, prevents drought, and enables restoration of habitat rather than destroying more. Why is EPCOR not proposing this cost efficient nature-based solution? And what are the risks insurance-wise of not actively proposing this approach when the concrete approach has been proven to fail? Another assumption behind EPCOR's misguided plan is reflected in their public engagement. They asked if people supported protecting the water treatment plants rather than if they supported protecting our drinking water, which is a different question. Uh, in fact, the way we see it, our EPCOR's plans threaten our drinking water, both by further degrading the floodplains that are required for the resilience of our city and by failing to create a long-term plan that moves away from making over 90 communities dependent upon two, just two water treatment plants located in these floodplains. EPCOR is making our water system extremely vulnerable, not just to Edmontonians, but through much of this part of the province. Lastly, we also learned that EPCOR has assumed that removing critical infrastructure from the floodplain is not possible because they could not meet existing demand for water during the period of moving this in infrastructure. Might people not be willing to temporarily decrease their water consumption to ensure protection of our drinking water into the future? EPCOR never asked this question. ERVCC sees EPCOR's flood mitigation plan as backward and inevitably extremely costly for the city of Edmonton and surrounding communities. We feel that to act responsibly, City Council cannot approve this project. We urge you to ask EPCOR to come up with another plan that aligns with the nature-based solutions for flood mitigation happening in cities around the world. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions of Ms. Qualtrick? Okay. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you very much and thanks for coming to speak today. You know, I think that uh, you know, your comments around uh, decentralization and, and naturalization to increase resiliency certainly uh, resonate with me. Uh, though, just wondering your thoughts on, on the sense of timing and the sense of urgency. Um, recognizing that flooding events are, are increasingly likely. Um, you know, from what I understand, the slow water approaches do take a fair bit of time to, to establish and um, become effective. So just, just your thoughts on sort of protecting some of this critical infrastructure uh, while, while some of these other initiatives are undertaken. Um, yeah, thank, thank you for the question. I met with EPCOR last week and I asked if they have any long-term plans at all for um, decentralization of the water treatment and they said no. So it doesn't seem like there are any plans underway at all, even into the future um, for that decentralization. Um, we also question why um, um, you know, those plans aren't, aren't already underway and why naturalization plants aren't already underway. Why has EPCOR tied, you know, their proposed um, renaturalization of areas around E.L. Smith and Rossdale um, to a tree removal pro project? You know, why aren't they doing this stuff anyways? So, you know, these are, these are plans that should have begun already. 
um, and they still aren't really um, being committed to at all. Okay, yeah, it's certainly some questions I can follow up on. Um, I think I think um, these don't necessarily need to be mutually exclusive, but appreciate uh, appreciate the feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for our speaker? Uh, not seeing any, so thanks uh, to you, Ms. Qualtrick, for your presentation today. Thank you. Uh, next, I'm going to go uh, to Mr. Beckett just to check in. Any any uh, commentary on this or questions you might offer? No, thanks. Thank you. We'll then go to questions of administration. Uh, I'll start with Councillor Stevenson. Sure, thank you. Um, Maybe I'll, I'll start from the top. You know, I thought it was very clearly set out in the report, but just wanted to clarify again that um, these this project will not make flooding worse in surrounding neighborhoods. I think it's a pretty straightforward answer, but uh, just wanted to confirm uh, on the public record that that's the case. Oh yeah, no, the delegation, I should clarify, to the delegation. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I just want to confirm that this project will not make flooding in adjacent neighborhoods worse. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm sure specifically you're referring to the Rossdale neighborhood, which is adjacent to the Rossdale water treatment plant. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, we, um, we are using, uh, in terms of the flood mapping, we follow the, the province is the one that does the flood maps and they illustrate um, how flooding will occur in the North Saskatchewan River flood plains, uh, North Saskatchewan River. Um, and we've engaged third party experts to conduct, to use that model and adjust that model um, with the implementation of the flood barriers at the Rossdale water treatment plant. And based on their models, it showed that there was a negligible impact, um, literally centimeters uh, in, in shift in the height of the, the water level with and without the flood barriers. And that's just due to the large area of the North Saskatchewan River flood plain. And so the, the, the barriers themselves are a very small uh, percentage or fraction of that area. Great, thank you for that. And, um, sorry, yeah. Councillor Stevenson, we also did share this information with the Rossdale Community League on more than one occasion, so they, they've had a chance to see it and to understand um, the work that we've done. Great, great, thank you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm feeling a sense of urgency around this, recognizing how critical this infrastructure is. Uh, so that the plan is for these to be complete by 2027. Is that soon enough? Like. Is there, has there been consideration of accelerating that or what's, what's the thinking around the timing? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for recognizing the importance and urgency of this work. Um, I'm sure you can recognize that these are, that our sites have uh, lots of sensitivity, uh, historical, archeological mm -hmm. sensitivity, cultural sensitivity. Um, we have a need to maintain detailed and meaningful engagement as we progress the construction um, of the barriers. Um, and it's also complex, the construction itself, um, because we need to continue the operation of the water plants um, and also plant security. Um, so we will be looking at, at options to potentially um, increase the, sp the speed at which we uh, complete these, but we have to take those constraints into consideration, as well as budget and resource mm. constraints. Okay, no, that's really helpful. You know, I think if it's budgetary constraints alone, there's reason to accelerate, but, uh, but appreciate the more fulsome uh, uh, picture in terms of what what other factors are are informing that timeline um, So, you know speaking about sort of the immediate urgency, you know I did want to pick up on the question from our speaker in terms of a longer-term decentralization plan, you know, just in terms of uh, Resiliency wondering what you know what the thinking is there in terms of the long-term planning and also maybe some of the constraints just in terms of how far from a water source the, the treatment plants can be uh, regardless of size. Mm -hmm. That's a very complex question. Um, we do have two water plants. Um, there's, there's many aspects to consider when you think about decentralization. And my understanding as well, uh, the, the conversation around decentralization often includes um, water reuse as a component. 
So um, our evaluation of that for Edmonton specifically has determined that um, it makes sense or could make sense in an industrial location, maybe where there's a, a number of industrial facilities sited together, they could have their own water treatment for that area, which would include recycling of water, uh, like their gray water. Um, but but uh, and for the broader residential aspect, it introduces a lot of risks like cross connection if you have a separate system where you're trying to recycle water. So so for Edmonton's um, situation, especially you know in other communities where it's, where it's hot, they can do a lot more of, of uh, reuse of, of water for irrigation, but given our climate, it's, it's a lot more challenging. So that's that's uh, in terms of sort of the de decentralization uh, topic. That's that's been an aspect of it that we've considered and looked at, and I think it is possible for for uh, an industrial location. Um, in terms of um, the, the water treatment plants that we have currently. Um, the North Saskatchewan River is quite a challenging river to treat for, for water treatment. And so having two state-of-the-art facilities where we're able to attract um, highly skilled employees and not just operators and maintenance staff, but our scientists, our engineers, our even our, you know, our regulatory expertise uh, that, we, that you saw earlier, um, all those kinds of people, that it's, it's much easier um, for an area to attract um, them when, it's, when they're concentrated in a few, few facilities. Um, and so the other communities are, are, are taking advantage of that by, by tapping into that expertise. Smaller communities having their own smaller water treatment plants. Um, the North Saskatchewan River, as I said, is a challenging uh, source to treat. There would be a complex treatment process. And historically, small communities have had a very hard time um, attracting skilled operators. And so this is, this is one angle. There's many angles, but that, that's, a, that's one part of it. Um, even if the idea of moving the water plants was, was under consideration, there would still need to be infrastructure at the river in order to bring that water to the treatment plant. Um, you could site water plants further away, but it would just cost you more to pump that water to the water treatment plant. Um, in Edmonton, our two plants, um, they're situated near the water to make it easy to access the water. Um, and some of that infrastructure has been there since the 1940s. So there's extensive investment on the part of our ratepayers and our citizens, and just the, the cost to move those out of the out of the um, the river valley would be extensive. We we estimate probably two billion dollars per plant, and that just would not be um, a prudent use of ratepayers' funds compared to. Uh, protecting them in place um, and taking advantage of the government grants that we're getting. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, that answered all of my questions as well. So I appreciate those comments. Any further questions for yeah. our delegation? Can you go? Councillor Tang. Great, thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, very thorough. Um, I guess just following on that, and I wanted a clarification too, the grants that you have cited from provincial and federal government to do this work, is that pretty specific to this particular work? Does it involve kind of flexibility and scope, say naturalization and that kind of stuff? Um, it is very specific to this this work. We had to demonstrate the um, you know the socio socioeconomic impact if we were to lose the water plants, and that was was a big factor in receiving the grants. Um, certainly, the naturalization um, is a part of it. I mean, in, in terms of the actual construction of the barriers, will involve the, the renaturalization um, surrounding the, the areas where we will be uh, constructing the barriers. Right and. Um yeah, no, that's helpful, thank you. And then I'm also just wondering how much of the funding would then come from the water rates um, in Edmonton after accounting for the grants? Um, our current estimate for the project is about 65 million. So there'd be um, 65 minus 22. Okay, so 40 something. Yes, and it, that was in our um, rate filing, Right. our previous rate filing. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, and I'm curious in terms of, uh, I guess, a couple questions on the engagement. Um, again, I'm noting that this is at the refined level, kind of similar to my question, line of question earlier. I guess just in general, EPCOR doesn't do anything beyond any other level beyond refine because of the technicality, because of precedence. Is that... Um, our engagement on this project has been so extensive. It's I think it's hard to define what what you would, what, how you would categorize it. But I might call on one of my 
colleagues, Jed, do you want to speak to that any further? Or? <coughs> no? <laughs> yeah, I'm. Yeah, I'm just noting that when, in comparison to when, when kind of um, placed in parallel with the with, with, with the city's engagement, I, I do recognize you have done quite a bit of engagement, but again, it's that expectation that at that level, there's not a whole lot of major changes that that can happen. It's really for awareness raising, education. Um, would you Would okay. you agree? Duly noted. I mean, I think we are, we have been seeking input into the look and feel of the barriers. That has definitely um, been incorporated into the design. And we will continue to seek input into some amenities that maybe could be included right. um, in, the, in the barrier design. And that, I mean, there was definitely an, a desire to you know, keep the barriers as close to the water plant as possible so that we weren't impacting the riparian area or the path that goes by Rossdale, um, as well as to keep them as natural as possible. And so we, where, where we could, we, we use the earthen embankments. Uh, we've only put the walls where, um, for, for reasons like to keep it as tight as possible, or for um, the fact that there's other ground pipes um, underneath that we had to use the wall. So we've limited the use of the walls as much as possible to keep it looking more natural. I appreciate that, thank you. Um, and then, so given the alignment to the climate strategy, you have engaged with our Energy Transition Climate Resilience Committee, yes? Um, technically, no. We did propose coming to present to them, um, but we were not able to get onto the agenda for, for one of their meetings. Okay. Okay. Um, and I'm, I was noting a bit of an interesting feedback from the public about incorporating recreation and community gathering spaces. Though the primary objective for this project is infrastructure for flood mitigation, I'm curious, how do you, like, what do you do with that feedback like that? How do you realize it? Uh, well, a few ideas that, um, that that could cover might even be something as simple as a bench where people could just have a rest on the, on the, you know, on the walk. Um, definitely some information, um, placards, signs about the history of the mm -hmm. area, um, the indigenous history, the ex explanation as to what we do in the water plants, those kinds of things. Okay. Um, uh, that, you know, I'll stop there. Thank you very much for the presentation and the responses. Thank you. Mayor Sohi. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, sorry, I missed the presentation, and uh, uh, I absolutely understand the need for uh, these mitigation uh, uh, efforts. Uh, Want to start by asking you about the engagement with urban indigenous population, uh, because uh, these sites are significant, quite significant, uh, particularly Rossdale for urban uh, indigenous population in general, but also there's a lot of interest. Uh, among urban indigenous population of Edmonton. Um, Jed Johns is here from EPCOR. He's going to take your question, Mayor Sohi. Thank you for the question, uh, Your Worship. Um, EPCOR um, engaged with over 32 indigenous nations and communities on this project starting in spring of 2021. Um, this also included a urban indigenous uh, session where we held that both virtually and in person at uh, near the Rossdale Community League for urban indigenous participants. Mm -hmm. But mainly we've been communicating through the consultation offices and uh, the delegated, office, delegated offices of First Nations, Métis and other indigenous communities um, around Edmonton and in Alberta um, who have historical, cultural uh, and um, uh, familial connections to the Rossdale lands especially. Um, has There's definitely been an interest to those Indigenous nations and communities and so we've continued to bring them to site, have walking tours, participate in ceremony, have active monitoring happening at the site over the last couple of years and planning additional monitoring of excavations that happen at Rossdale as well. So that engagement will carry on as uh, particularly like if you if you discover uh, 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 as you as you progress through the the, the construction, and you know you could, particularly Rossdale being a burial ground, and uh, uh, or other artifacts like so. There's ongoing Correct. engagement, Correct. And monitoring, and uh, 
Correct. Um, we've been actively uh, engaging in the development of an archaeological finds process with nations, and so nations who wish to participate and develop that um, have been working with us with knowledge holders and elders um, to have a process when there is a find. Um, and this goes above and beyond uh, provincial regulations currently in place for the site uh, because we believe that uh, nations should have this information about any finds taking place um, at Rossdale and at E.L. Smith. Okay, well, th well that, that's good, and uh, those are kind of main cons questions I wanted to raise with you, and, uh, uh, but just on a, I also noticed, just kind of another thing that popped into my mind about the height of these barriers. There's a significant difference between at Rossdale and the, and the E.L. Smith. Is there reasons for that? Like, were, were, were some, one are, some are larger than the others, right? So, it's just the, the impact of, uh, that you have to do to mitigate? Exactly. It's really based on um, at what level the flood waters would come to for the flood level that we're designing to, um, based on the location, as well as the lay of the land, um, okay. because that has it has quite a significant impact. Um, you know, the walls will be higher where there's perhaps a localized dip in the land. Okay. Um, at Rostell, as you noted, um, they're quite far back from the river, and so they're they're actually quite short. Mm, um, okay, I see. Okay, no, those are the questions I would just, so thank you for answering those uh, questions related to urban indigenous engagement, because there's a lot of interest in, uh, in Rossdale, so we want to continue to flag those with not only the city, but our important partners at Ep EPCOR. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Stevens. Yes, thank you. Maybe uh, just to administration specifically, so some of the, the comments around naturalizing uh, uh, the River Valley shores, I guess. Is that is that going to be part of our climate adaptation work that's underway in terms of the naturalization? Um, Councillor Tang, I'm going to just refer that's that okay. question perhaps to our um, ecological planner or to Mr. Churchill to speak more specific. Oh, sorry, Councillor Stevenson, um, to speak more specifically to. Um, certainly, we'll be considering what what is required from um, a climate mitigation perspective and from a climate resilience perspective with respect to that naturalization. But I'll maybe refer those specifically to Mr. Adhikari. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I think at this point we haven't finalized whether or not the naturalization that could be achieved as a part of this project is directly linked with our climate resilience project, but since this project is um, uh, still under the design stage, so there are opportunities that we can tie up with uh, our climate goals, um, but there are also other ongoing projects like the Toss the Water, um, as well as um, um, there is a um, Rostel overall development project. So I think there are opportunities to integrate with other projects as well. But as far as we understand, EPCOR is ready to work with any other, um, you know, city initiatives, wherever that meets our own goal. Um, so, yeah, so this is an opportunity for us to work with EPCOR. Great, great. So if there was an opportunity to optimize um, some work that the city was doing through the sort of offsets for these projects, that would that would be an opportunity. I'm seeing head nodding from, from EPCOR as well. Great. Great. And then just very briefly, are we undertaking similar flood mitigation um, strategies and planning for some of our critical city infrastructure in the area? So I'm thinking Fire Station 21, just adjacent to the Rossdale power plant and also the, the Mutart LRT station potentially? So Councillor, my understanding is that uh, with respect to the city's infrastructure, we look at a one in 100 flood um, mitigation approach and that is for all of our critical infrastructure. Um, that's according to the design standards volume four that EPCOR also owns. Um, but we could find out in particular, I don't know about those facilities in particular, but we could find out more about that if that's Sure, important. sure, yeah, we can follow up offline just about a general flood, flood approach at the, at the city for some of our, our um, assets. But that's great, thank you, no further questions. Great, thank you. Um, uh, Councillor Tang has had a round already, correct? Yeah, okay. Councillor Pekin. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, so, I don't know how else to put this. Does anyone want to address the irony uh, of uh, building uh, climate resistant infrastructure? And yet we don't seem to have a clear plan for ecosystem preservation. Can I 
take this one? <laughs> yeah. Um, there is always uh, I impacts when we are dealing with uh, the, you know, the projects that has adaptation goal as well as, um, you know, like the critical infrastructure. So this is really a fit between where our infrastructures are. Um, so it is irony that we have a critical infrastructure right next to the river valley, which is ecologically significant. But we have to always uh, find a balance between like what is more important in terms of um, uh, both values, right? So the ecological connectivity is very important. But what we are looking here is uh, by creating this uh, resiliency, we're not disconnecting the ecological corridor at all. So there will be impacts, but we are hoping that the mitigation uh, proposed by the EPCOR should be somehow um, be beneficial uh, to continue uh, or like to remain that connectivity intact. So there is no disconnection on that ecological corridor from our evaluation of the environmental impact assessment. But yes, there will be impacts that might take some time um, to regenerate that level of uh, species that we will be losing from this project. But we have a room to grow on that spot. And we're also trying to re-naturalize some of the impacted area um, below the pump house. So we hope that uh, renaturalization can uh, certainly improve the site better than as it is right now. Um, so yes, um, there are ecological impacts, but compared to the critical infrastructures, uh, resiliency factors, I think uh, we should be you know, allowing some of those uh, um, impacts be go, but we are counting on like how the renaturalization will go. We will actively monitor that and then we'll try to make sure that uh, the overall uh, adaptation strategy will be effectively implemented by EPCOR in the long run. Okay, so just to be clear, um, is there a plan to ensure that there is a connected path, essentially, for larger game like moose or deer, uh, who obviously cannot be squeezed into like a small uh, pathway, but actually needs something quite broad? Yeah, so from the EIA, we also asked them to do the uh, short skip analysis that we have established with our environmental monitoring. And that always showed that uh, one of the pump house area in the Alice Smith Solar Farm and the, the Rostell side are one of the pinch points, already non pinch points. So we're trying to understand these projects will not uh, further complicate those pinch points and they will even further do some mitigations to, um, uh, you know, like get uh, the connectivity better um, than the current conditions. So we have okay. been watching and monitoring those. Right, so I didn't actually see a lot of that in the report. Um, so the EIA report should be, uh, if you read the I EIA report. I didn't mention that, but it doesn't actually have, it, to my mind, didn't have a robust plan uh, that, uh, yeah. you know, maybe uh, you are right, could be uh, beefed up a little bit. Councillor, yeah. That uh, vegetation management plan has not been totally flushed out. Um, and then we are hoping that EPCOR, uh, the plan being mostly within the EPCOR's land, we are leaving it to EPCOR how they will be rolling it out. Um, thanks, Richard. Um, thank you, Councillor Plaquette. Um, I, I'll add a few comments. Um, you noted the, the pinch point at um, the Ale Smith water plant. Um, so there's two uh, pump houses that are quite close to the river at E.L. Smith. And that, at that, that point is where um, the wildlife corridor is the narrowest. Um, and as Achute had mentioned in our previous um, and continuing wildlife monitoring, we did observe that the large animals go through that area. They are, they are able to pass through that area. Um, I will mention though that currently at E.L. Smith, there's a double fence line. So there's a fence line closer to the plant and then um, further, further out, there's another fence line. I believe it was added because the first fence was too short. Um, our plan is to remove the outer fence and the wall will be situated um, where the inside fence is. So we'll actually be increasing that area, which is great news. Um, as well as uh, Achute had mentioned, we are also uh, renaturalizing the slope that goes basically from those low lift pump houses down towards the river because it's, it's um, 
not very well naturalized at the moment. So that's, that's a big aspect of this plan. Uh, the vegetation management plan that's mentioned um, is a long-term plan for looking at ways we can re-naturalize across our, um, both of our sites. And we're also exploring, um, through conversations with, with city administration, some other areas that we could, we could uh, work with them to plant more trees or re-naturalize outside of our fence lines. Um, Yolanda, did you want to speak? So Yolanda Cassier was here as well. She's the project manager. Thanks, Audrey. I only well, have I, I just a note. I'm way out of time, so this is at the discretion of the chair. Yeah, no, it's fine. Carry on, please. Go ahead. Yeah, I only have one thing to add to that great explanation, Audrey. Um, in terms of total area for impact, um, we're at El Smith, um, looking at 0 0.3 hectares of removal, and um, the space that Audrey was just talking about in terms of the outer fence line and uh, improvements to the area between that fence line and the river, uh, that's a 0 0.27 hectare area that we're looking at uh, improving and augmenting. Um, so just wanted to highlight that as well. Okay, uh, I don't see any other comments. Uh, any other questions then for our delegation? Okay, Councillor Tang. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for, f for for that additional input because I noted as I had a follow up. Um, so, just back to your comment earlier about the consideration for having uh, on the decentralization piece uh, that having smaller treatment plants in in the region in you know in the smaller communities is not feasible given difficulty attracting workforce uh, and the and you're you're attracting you know highly skilled um, employees in this you know pretty complex system um, but I guess I think my reaction to that was you know in all the conversations I've been hearing with some of our you know rural communities who are quite actually desperate to 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 augment their workforce for economic development like could this not be um, a good, you know, opportunity, um, and and you know, there's a lot of I think uh, work that these communities are doing to make sure that they are attracting whether it's, you know, highly skilled workers in in the in the water industry or if it's doctors or physicians to keep them there. So I feel like there's a lot of work going on in there. Um, while it may not be immediate feasible, you know. I guess I don't understand why that can't be a long-term consideration. There's nothing stopping any of those communities from going down that path if that's what they would like to do. And, and, and I guess no one's ever, has anyone ever expressed interest or? Um, not to my knowledge. I mean, any community that, that has it, there's, there are communities, other communities on the North Saskatchewan River, smaller communities that have their own water treatment. Um, it's honestly, our system has been growing. There've been more communities asking to be added. Um, to our regional water uh, supply um, over the years. It's, it's grown significantly. To use the water, but not necessarily have the, the infrastructure there for them to kind of you know, process it more locally, right? That's right, they distribute it themselves, so we sell it wholesale, and then beyond that, they do have their own staff and their own pipes and, and reservoirs to, to pump and distribute the, the water to their customers. Right, I guess I would just, you know, I would just encourage that conversation not to 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 stop but although if you don't necessarily have anybody approaching you um that's a bit of a different story um we, and and I've, we've had this conversation previously and but you know just wondering for you know, the public forum um just on the nature-based solutions and kind of you know vegetations can sometimes serve that flood mitigation role can you talk about how much you've explored some of these solutions mm -hmm. before landing on the current plan mm -hmm. so um, first of all, I want to mention that there's more than one way that a community can flood. So the flooding we're looking at for this project is the river overtopping its banks. There's also uh, flooding that we, we term urban flooding, where there's an intensive rainstorm and the storm sewer system cannot handle it. And that's how people end up with flooded basements or water in the streets or flooded um, underpasses. This has been integrated into our stormwater integrated resource plan. So we are um, implementing a variety of techniques um, in order to deal with that type of flooding. 
there also are the situations where both of those flooding could occur at the same time or could interact with each other where you have um, you know, such a large rainstorm that it's causing both river flooding and urban flooding. And so um, we have to have a variety of techniques to protect against those. Um, so the green um, infrastructure that was discussed earlier, the dry ponds that was discussed earlier, those are all intended to slow the movement of water um, in the event of, of an urban flood. Um, as well, um, you know, so there's other avenues like uh, EPCOR is offering opportunities for, for the public to come and have a flood assessment of their home. So people can undertake actual flood proofing of their own property. So we have a whole suite of, of options that we're considering. Right. Um, no, thanks for that. So, you know, what I'm hearing too is, you know, some of those na nature based solutions have been explored. They may be more effective at slowing down kind of the flood. But when we're talking about one in 100 or one in 500, the scale of which far exceeds uh, what the, some, of, so, some of these nature-based solutions could manage. And that's why the urgency and the need for this project, would you say? Uh, yeah, I mean, and, and because of the fact that the water plants are in the floodplain, um, yeah. those aren't feasible. You know, we've, we've engaged experts, the North American experts, on what is the best approach for protecting the water treatment plants, and, and this is, is the advice that we've received. But certainly, as mentioned, like there's, there's a whole suite of things that a community can do mm -hmm. to protect against the different types of flooding, and so we, we have all of those um, in our tool belt. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm done. Thank you. Um, any further questions? No, the motion is not on the floor yet. Uh, sure. It doesn't matter to me either one. What's that? Yeah, sorry. Councillor Tang on, uh, on a subsequent one. Go ahead. Sorry, just uh, one last question. Um, in the vegetation plan, you did say that, you know, the area you'll be revegetating will be much larger than the trees being removed or the area affected. Um, and it will be a, like a variety of strategies. Um, but do you have a sense of like how many trees you would be replacing? Um, in terms of number of trees to be planted, is that your question? Yeah. Uh, not at this time. We are still developing this plan. Um, it's something that we are committing to, uh, to do at these water treatment plants. However, there are a number of considerations, including our operational needs, maintenance needs, security needs. And so uh, we're continuing to develop this vegetation management plan in parallel with the continuing the uh, detailed design for um, the protections as well. Sorry, the ecological protections? Uh, oh. The flood oh. mitigation protections, as well as this vegetation management plan, are both progressing through the detailed phases okay. together. Can you just remind me what the timeline for that will be, when, when it will be finalized? For the vegetation management plan or the detailed design for the flood uh, I guess both. And also earlier, the plan that you had mentioned that still needs to be fleshed out more for the ecological corridor? Um, for the ecological corridor, uh, actually all three will be um, finalized by early to mid-2024. Will we get a checkpoint on that at utility or no? If you're interested, we're happy to come back. Or through memo or I don't, I don't know what the, the appetite is, but I just wanted to get some clarity on the timeline. Thank you for that. That's it. Thank you. Councillor Stevenson. I think you're happy to put the motion on the floor. Uh, the utility committee recommends to city council that the Edmonton water treatment plans, flood mitigation barriers, site location, study, and environmental impact assessment, assessment as outlined in attachments one and two of the September 5th, 2023 utility committee report UPE 01896 be approved. And two, that the location of the flood mitigation barriers within the River Valley is outlined in attachment one of the September 5th, 2023 utility committee report UPE 01896 be deemed essential pursuant to bylaw 7188 North Saskatchewan River Valley Area Redevelopment Plan. Thank you I, I, uh, for putting the motion on the floor. I wonder if we want to amend that to add a number three that um, administration follow up with a memo at the completion of detailed design. That sounds like a great suggestion. Just to, to address uh, Councillor Tang's concerns. Sure. Start with a memo and a memo. 
can lead to other things if it's not satisfactory. Uh, Councillor Stevenson for further questions. Yeah, maybe on point, the newly minted point three. Um, so just in terms of some of the principles with the, the tree replacement, I know when we were looking at Horlock Park, for example, the city had a policy of uh, uh, at least replacement uh, and also looking at replacement values. So mature trees would have more than a one-to-one -one replanting. Is that a similar approach that FCOR will be taking in developing these plans? The plans aren't necessarily focused on trees in particular, but rather the Prairie Parkland ecoregion. Mm -hmm. There's various stages of that. There can be grassland, there could be fully forested or uh, any stage in between. And part of what we need to do is look at which stages would belong where in order to interact properly with our infrastructure. Um, in addition, as Audrey has mentioned, we are looking for ways to um, uh, interact and interface with the city and, and some of the naturalization plans that um, you have in place. So um, yeah, that will, that will follow the details. Great, yeah, appreciate that approach and look forward to, to more details in a potential uh, memo, uh, as in point three. Clerk, did you need any specific wording around that or? That would be greatly appreciated. Okay, so maybe um, that, uh, that administration prepare a memo uh, for council at the completion of the detailed planning for flood, Vegetation, okay. Ecological Do we corridor. ecological corridor and flood protection? Okay. Just vegetation management plan Just would probably suffice in the detailed design of the barriers. Okay, and then would that include the sort of the vegetation? Would that include the ecological network? Because I think there's interest in that. Uh, that'll be part of the detailed design for the flood barriers, part of the landscaping plans that make up that. that detailed design. Okay, sounds great. Maybe administration could type that into chat for clerks. Well, I, while we're crafting that then, is there any further questions uh, of the delegation? I'll leave potential UNESCO World Heritage Sites question alone at this point. So that's a no. I don't see any further questions. Motion on the floor. Anybody to speak to it? Okay. Well, then we'll just wait for uh, number three to be crafted and then we'll call the vote. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Tang. Got kicked out. I got kicked out of this. Um, yeah, I guess just want to convey, you know, thank you for this work. I think it's it's very extensive, and lots of conversation has been done. And um, you know, I do appreciate for a lot of the questions, there is a lot of you know work that has been done, uh, and conversations and thought that has been put forward. I don't necessarily feel and back to this. I think there's some valid points raised um, today through the speakers. I don't necessarily think we need to stop at um, stop at that decentralization conversation. And you know, I I recognize it's much longer term, and uh, um, and I just encourage those pieces to, to to continue. I feel like I I can ab absolutely understand the concerns when it comes to the vegetation um, pieces, but I, I do feel that, you know, having that check, third checkpoint, um, uh, I look forward to seeing what are some of those details that will be flushed out. Um, and I also want to say, you know, I, I think that on the indigenous engagement side of things, recognizing you've done, you know, a few pipe ceremonies on this, f on four pipe ceremonies on this project, um, and I don't know how some of the other EBCOR projects or, or even city projects have gone kind of to that extent. Um, just want to say I really appreciate, you know, um, really prioritizing um, um, the relationship with um, the indigenous peoples of this land in, in this project, so thank you. Um, I don't necessarily think this might, might, might satisfy everybody out there, but I do feel that 
um, for the work that's been put in. You know, I, you know, I certainly think we need to kind of move forward with this project. Um, and I appreciate a lot of the work that's been put, put in. Thank you. Not sure how close we are. Uh, I just briefly, I don't think we have any choice. I think this work is being done in a very considered and deliberate way and trying to encapsulate all of the input of, uh, of all of the stakeholders that uh, have a view on this. I think when we talk about, you know, preserving the ecology of our water source, but not just our water source in the city of Edmonton, but a water source that serves countless communities uh, stretching in all directions from the city. Uh, we have no choice but to protect these water treatment plants. And we heard earlier, I think it might have been missed, that the replacement cost, the cost to pick one of these plants up and put it up on the bank even, is north of $2 billion. Uh, the integration of pipes and pumps and reservoirs that stretch hundreds of kilometers in either direction, that is not a trivial exercise. Uh, and, and uh, you know, even if that were uh, a long-term goal, uh, the work that would go into that is monumental uh, and would not happen fast, not at, by any stretch of the imagination. It certainly wouldn't happen as fast as uh, our uh, environment is changing and the risk of flooding is, uh, is becoming greater. So uh, it was my experience working in industry when the floods hit Calgary that, uh, you know, that rainstorm over the course really of, of a long weekend flooded the entire basin down in Calgary, the Elbow River and the Bow River, uh, caused untold damage in a number of communities along that river. And there was no way to know whether the, the storm sewers backed up first or the river ran over its bank first. All that was known was all the infrastructure was decommissioned pretty much out of service for a very long time. Uh, and I, I don't know that we want to be, and I'm not sure anybody's putting this alternative out there, but I don't sure we want to be standing here the day after a, a four or five day monumental rainstorm wondering how we're going to supply water to a couple million people. I, uh, so I, understanding that there's others that would like to see some nuance to this, we have no choice in this, and I think the work is very well done and very well received. Uh, Councillor Paquette? Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, agreed. Uh, we have to go forward uh, simply, you know, because it's prudent. My concerns are a few. One is that we are underestimating what the impact of uh, um, a changing climate will deliver uh, as far as potential uh, flood events and the frequency of them. Um, so, you know, any attempt at mitigating that is probably good, but I do actually have concerns that it's not enough. Um, I'm also a little bit concerned about the mixed messaging uh, that can occur. So that's got to be pretty clear about uh, adding more infrastructure into the River Valley while at the same time preserving those wildlife corridors. Um, you know, there's... Uh, you know, it's an interesting debate between greenhouse gas emissions and a changing climate and uh, the preservation, even in our cities, of, uh, of wildlife and uh, ecosystem uh, diversity and management. It's a, it's a difficult conversation, but it's one that we should have clear-eyed and not shy away from. Um, the other aspect that uh, I sort of jokingly alluded to, although it was less of a joke and more of just a bit of an irony is that uh, it's also not lost on me that the areas that we're uh, talking about could actually uh, fall under the criteria of World UNESCO Heritage Sites, which is an entirely other conversation um, that we had uh, in robust debate during the E.L. Smith solar farm uh, uh, situation, which um, no one denied that that was actually uh, something that we were doing. It's uh, purposely and consciously um, avoiding that question. So these are things to consider uh, in city building um, at this point, just simply for the sake of uh, the people who are here. 
uh, we do actually have to mitigate uh, dangers. And so that's what we're doing. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Any other comments before I go to Councillor Stevenson to close? Councillor Stevenson. Thank you. Just want to echo the comments. Um, uh, I'm really grateful for this work coming forward. I can't think of anything more essential in terms of uh, protecting the, the drinking water of our community and surrounding communities. Um, I am really pleased to see this work going forward and if anything want it to happen faster just recognizing that we're going to increasingly see these weather events that um, that are happening because of climate change. Uh, I really appreciate the balance that's being taken by the team in terms of the um, uh, vegetation management um, and really trying to ensure that these have um, little no no worsening impact and looking to improve conditions as well uh, and all the work that's happening with indigenous engagement is really really encouraging um, but certainly as was highlighted you know longer term uh, we do need to move towards that more holistic understanding of what truly protects our our drinking water and the source of our drinking water and so look forward to the ongoing climate mitigation and ecosystem restoration and preservation work that, uh, that is underway. Uh, so with that, happy to go to vote. Thank you, please vote. We have all the vote. Please display the vote. Suspense is killing us. Each scribe is giving us technical issue. Uh, we will refresh and then send it back again. First time for everything. You can just give us the results, Mr. Clerk. I'm sure they're. We have seven votes in favor. Great, thank you. That motion is carried. Thank you, uh, Mr. Clerk. Thanks uh, also to the delegation for all the conversation. I'm going to suggest at this point we are on the cusp of our noon recess, so we'll pick up item 7.4 at uh, 1.30 when we return.
Good afternoon, we are live from River Valley Room. Uh, good afternoon. I'll call the uh, September 5th Utility Committee meeting back to order and start with a roll call of committee members. Uh, Councillor Paquette. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor Jams. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor Tang. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor Salvador. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor Stevenson. Good afternoon. And I think that's all from committee. Uh, Mayor Sohi's not here, but he may join us. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't think we have any other councillors joining us at the moment. So uh, we're on to item 7.4, the single use item reduction bylaw implementation update. And I think we'll start with a presentation from administration. Please go ahead. Thank you. Hello, my name is Eddie Robert, Deputy City Manager of City Operations, and with me today to discuss today's report on the single-use uh, item reduction bylaw is Dennis Dubenbill, Branch Manager of Waste Services, Allison Abink, Senior Integrated Waste uh, Policy Planner uh, with Waste Services, and Krista Berezowski, uh, Director of Business Integration and Technical Services. The single-use item reduction bylaw uh, took effect two months ago. And today we're going to provide you with a brief update on its implementation, including our early observations, how we're supporting residents and businesses, and the long-term monitoring and impact of the single-use items of single-use items in Edmonton. And now I'll pass it over to Dennis to start the presentation. Thanks, Eddie. So the city first identified the need to reduce single-use plastics in the 25-year strategy, which was approved in September 2019. Residents and stakeholders supported regulating or banning single-use items during public engagement. This led to the creation of our Waste Reduction Roadmap and the Single-Use Item Strategy as one of the roadmap's key actions. In 2020, the federal government announced plans to reach a zero plastics waste goal by 2030, which included banning or restricting the use of certain single-use plastics. With the approval of the roadmap, Utility Committee specifically requested that the single-use item reduction plan complement but not be but delayed by these expected federal regulations. While the federal regulations focus solely on single-use plastics, the city's plan addressed single-use items made of any kind of material. Our plan wants to reduce the negative impacts of single-use items waste and not substitute single-use plastics or other materials. In October 4th, 2022, the single-use items bylaw or regu regulation reduction bylaw was passed by council. On July 1st, the bylaw took effect, regulating, banning, or introducing a fee for the use of single-use items in Edmonton, including plastic shopping bags, food accessories like utensils and straws, and foam plates, cups, and containers. Single-use cups are not banned, but restaurants must serve dine-in orders in reusable cups and have a written policy for accepting reusable customer cups. I'll now pass it on to Allison Abink, who is leading our single-use items initiative. Thank you. To help Edmonton businesses and residents prepare for the changes, we developed a comprehensive communication and outreach plan to support residents and businesses throughout the transition. Business resources were launched in late 2022 on the city website, including a bylaw guide, videos, and printable resources to help them and their customers with the bylaw. Businesses were directed to these resources via mailouts and emails. A low barrier grant was also launched, providing support funding to eligible local businesses and nonprofits. Starting in 2023, educational campaigns ramped up. We ran digital and out-of-home advertising campaigns targeting both businesses and residents 
to build awareness of the coming bylaw requirements and available resources. We also ran several webinars for businesses to learn about the bylaw and ask questions. Our in-person outreach team began visiting restaurants to assess how the change is going and monitor compliance. Throughout the transition, we used feedback gathered through our many channels to keep our website, customer support scripts, and printable resources updated to ensure responsive support for Edmontonians. For example, we've added information about drive throughs to our website, and more printable resources for both customers and staff at drive throughs will be available soon. Next slide, please. Uh, so this slide just shows a few of the examples of some of the resources that we've developed to educate and inform the public about the bylaw. So the bylaw guide, posters, and other resources are available on our website, edmonton.ca slash single use. Next slide, please. Uh, during this transition, we did have an outreach team visiting restaurants and food vendors, as mentioned before. Prior to the bylaw taking effect, they informed businesses about the change, provided information if they were unaware of the bylaw, and collected data on where they were experiencing barriers. As portrayed on the left in this figure, uh, they found that while roughly 20% of businesses were not aware of the bylaw before it took effect, two-thirds of the businesses visited were already compliant or largely compliant with the bylaw regulations. After July 1st, they checked in to see how businesses were faring, assessed compliance, continued collecting data on barriers, and provided education. Almost all businesses were fully compliant or had a plan for full compliance. And a plan for full compliance here could mean that a restaurant had ordered reusable cups but that they hadn't arrived yet. In some cases, we prepared a letter of acknowledgement to those businesses to confirm that they had a strategy for compliance and to continue to support them through that transition. We'd like to thank our Edmonton businesses at this point for their leadership over the last few months. And our outreach team will continue to actively support those businesses until late October or early November. Next slide, please. We've categorized the inquiries coming into our dedicated email account for business support and grouped them into topics. The most common one has been about bags, including the bag fee, what kind of bags the fee applies to, and whether GST is applied to the bag fee. The majority of the other slash miscellaneous category was either general criticism of the bylaw or inquiries that covered multiple topics. The majority of this feedback was from residents, even though this account was intended to communicate regulations with businesses. Next slide, please. We have multiple points of contact for both residents and businesses to provide feedback on the bylaw, including our waste customer support team, a dedicated email account, and of course, 311. You can see how inquiries about the SUI bylaw grew leading up to July 1st and peaked during that first month of implementation, which was expected. To put these numbers into context, we received 1,088 single-use inquiries for this year so far. By comparison, 311 and Waste Customer Support Team receive an average of over 6,000 waste inquiries per month. As residents give us feedback on the bylaw, we've adjusted, been adjusting their scripts to more effectively answer their questions. Next slide, please. And work on single-use item reduction isn't finished, either in Edmonton or in Canada. Other municipalities are implementing their own single-use item bylaws, such as Banff and Calgary and Alberta. And the next phase of the federal single-use plastic regulation will take effect December 20th, banning the sale and provision of items like plastic straws, stir sticks, and shopping bags. This federal ban will affect the municipal bylaw exemption we provided to charitable and nonprofit organizations, which was known and anticipated when we drafted our bylaw. We will return to committee in November to amend this bylaw and align with this federal update. The success of our plan and bylaw will be determined by a per capita reduction in SUI. Our goal is to see a 10% reduction by 2025 and a 20% reduction by 2027. To keep us accountable to these goals, we'll be monitoring the impact of this bylaw over multiple years. Waste characterization studies will help us monitor changes in single use items found in residential waste collection like the carts and the bins and public waste containers over time. We're also collaborating with our Capital City cleanup team on litter audits. To further our goals, the fee for new paper or reusable bags will increase on July 1st of 2024 to 25 cents per bag and $2 per new reusable bag. And these fees are consistent with many other municipalities with their own single use item bylaws, including Banff, Victoria, um, Vancouver and San Francisco. I'll now pass it back to Dennis to conclude our presentation. Our 25-year waste strategy and broader waste management goals all follow the internationally recognized waste hierarchy. 
This hierarchy goes beyond waste sorting and diversion and focuses on rethinking and reducing waste altogether rather than recycling or using other forms of waste management. Our strategy includes the goal of a 20% total waste reduction per capita and an overall 90% waste diversion from landfill. The targets in our single-use item strategy will help enable our community to meet these goals and our overall commitment to the environment, ultimately reducing waste, which will help make Edmonton a more livable city that supports our climate resilience goals. And that ends our presentation for today, and I'd like to open the floor for any questions. Uh, thank you. We'll start with uh, Councillor Tang, who selected this item. Great. Thank you very much, and thank you for this update. Um, you know, certainly our inboxes with our office are also, uh, we receive a lot of inquiries and feedback, uh, so I certainly was very much looking forward to this. Um, and I really appreciate how the report was very thorough. So um, I guess a few things, um, I'll just start what I have here. Um, in terms of the business, the businesses, those 30, when you say out of total of 34, 32 businesses, those are all in the food industry, like restaurants, fast food, is that right? I'm sorry, which slide were you talking about? It, it was just your, um, you know, uh, you know, this many businesses visited out of a total oh, yes. of 3,432 businesses, and those are all in the food and... Correct, those okay. would be restaurants and food vendors. Yeah. Oh, actually, do you, do you mind if I ask um, Mr. Beckett if there's any... Go right ahead. No, no, no comment, <laughs> okay. Um, and then I'm also wondering, um, did you like, and, and I don't know if I missed this in the report, but was there any like active complaints on the rest, on the businesses? Were you tracking that as well? You mean like uh, complaints from the public about yeah. businesses not uh, following the rules? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so far we've tracked about 16 um, I guess complaints from the general public, although at this point we're not calling them non-compliance because we haven't sent a bylaw officer to go out there and validate that because we're using that education first approach. Yeah. So when we do get a complaint, our education team does ensure to follow up with them, make sure to visit them to ensure the business is supported. Right, that's what I thought. Okay, that's good. Um, and then for the, the businesses who are managing that transition, what are they saying in terms of like, the cost of transition, you know, not everyone has access to that grant. Um, some of the, you know, re reusable wear that they might have to purchase is going to be more than, say, wh whether styrofoam or paper or whatever. Um, any feedback there? We haven't had a whole lot of direct cost-related feedback. There have been some concerns about using up the leftover, like, styrofoam um, and plastic bags, and so, um, because we were a little bit ahead of the federal guidelines, businesses have the opportunity to donate those and start making a bit of a transition early. Um, but yeah, uh, overall it seems that a lot of them have been transitioning fairly well um, and that the education first approach has been helping them to have the time to make those transitions and find other vendors uh, to get more sustainable and reusable serviceware. That's good. Um, I'll, I'll just say I've gotten some positive feedback from businesses about, you know, it's good that it's upon, like, cutlery is upon request. So I don't have to put out as much as I, as I used to. Um, just in terms of the cost uh, transition for next year, um, do you have any additional education plan to kind of make sure people are ready for this, another increase coming next year? Yeah, we are planning another round of uh, communications and education similar to this year through different channels, advertising, out-of-home advertising. Um, we're still in the planning phases of that now to make sure that we're taking that feedback from the first round and um, working on our website and scripting to better support everybody for the next, um, the next stage of, of changes. Yeah, um, I know for the, when it comes to fast food, there is maybe a bigger learning curve because of the size of the brown bag that, say, McDonald hands out. Um, I've seen photos circulating on social media of people directly dumping their fries into reusable. And I think in some cases, I just want to clarify, when, for example, fries comes in a packaging, that's primary packaging, that is not subject to this bylaw. And so if that's happening, if people are like sharing those kinds of experiences, it's probably because it's 
is there is a misinterpretation early on of the bylaw, you think? Um, so you're correct, like the, the food packaging that like a burger comes in, the wrapper or the box or the cup that fries come in is the primary packaging. So a shopping bag under the bylaw would be the bag used to transport food or like in the case of a grocery store, grocery items home. So the, the large takeout bag that all your food items are put into is considered a shopping bag under the bylaw. Even though it's much smaller than you know a typical shopping bag, a, a brown shopping bag from a grocery store. Yeah, so we, we don't have a size requirement for how big the size of the shopping bag is. So the takeout bags are definitely considered a shopping bag under the bylaw. Because I can see with that prices going up, you know, I th again, you might have a lot of similar kind of anxiety around that. I'm out of time. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to pick up there, I guess, the, on the fee for bags. So we didn't want people using plastic bags anymore, shopping bags. So those are not allowed. We want people using, presumably, paper bags or reusable bags. So we tell businesses that they can only supply a paper bag or allow somebody to purchase a reusable bag. How does the 15 cent fee help? So research has shown that if you charge a fee, you get the most um, change, like the, high, the higher level change. If you don't charge a fee, you leave it voluntary, people just stay within their own habits. So that's the research that says that the fee enables the change in behavior. So that's the fee. As it relates to single use versus paper, so again, ours is a single use item reduction, not a plastic reduction. And so we don't want people to use paper bags, we want people to bring the reusable bags. And so the fee doesn't relate to the fact that it's paper versus plastic. It's we want to try to reduce it all together. And by charging a nominal fee, which hopefully isn't too impactful, it causes people to think before they actually uh, do or don't decide whether they need the item. So you want me to use a paper bag. You don't want me to use a plastic bag. Or you want me to use a reusable bag. But in order to, re to use a reusable bag, you're going to make me pay a fee to get the bag. No, on top of the purchase price of the bag. No, because if you select not to use a bag, there is no fee. So when I go to a, so when I go to a fast food restaurant, you want me to take the little envelope of fries, and a reusable cup full of soda, and a hamburger in a paper envelope, and not have any bag at all to contain that to get it into my car. That's our goal. That's what a lot of people are currently doing in that uh, the fast service are providing it in a tray, which is being received by the public without a bag. And if they wish to use a bag, they can either bring you know, their own I you know, item or pay the 15 cents and get the bag. So the feedback I'm getting is a lot of places are simply saying, you know what, I'm tired of my staff getting all that blowback for 15 cents. Here's a paper bag with your stuff in it. Have a great day. So they're non-compliant with the bylaw. And I do know that uh, Elson might be able to provide a little bit of information uh, as to the work that we've started and that we will continue uh, with the business owners that have concern with respect to this. But um, the, let's, to be clear, the bylaw, the, that is the bylaw. The bylaw does say that if they don't use a bag, um, the 15 cents is not charged. If they do use a bag, there's a 50 cent fee at the drive throughs So we're effectively punishing people for at least migrating from a plastic bag to a paper bag. And we're punishing them further to migrate from a paper bag to a reusable bag. Like, if we didn't have the fees, mm -hmm. what would be the effect? What would be the outcome? So if we didn't have the fees, everybody would continue the way they've always been? No, they uh, wouldn't because they can't get a plastic bag. They would so get a paper bag. They would have a paper bag, which they already do. There's very few that have plastic bags. Well, they, they already do. So if, you're, if you've been frequenting a fast food restaurant, you've been getting a paper bag for some time. Now you're paying more for it. Correct. Unless you decide not to take it, then you're not paying that, that excess 15 cents. 
and we think that's better. It's reduced the bags, and we do have, uh, a, we can't name uh, who it is, but one of the major uh, retailers in our area that have said they've actually seen a reduction in the number of bags that they're having to purchase as, as, a, as a grouping of restaurants. Oh, and uh, I'd like to introduce Christina Hodgson Musso, who is uh, with our legal team, to provide a comment. Sorry, I don't have a chair, so I'm going to do the best I can. Um, <laughs> The bylaw isn't a punishment. The bylaw is a regulatory instrument that shapes behavior. That's we, not how people, I'm sorry, that's not how people see I know, see I'm it. just gonna explain right. exactly how this is supposed to shape behavior. We are putting fees on all new bags, all new bags. The purpose is to shape behavior so that people choose to bring their own reusable bag, their own reusable item. When I go to a fast food restaurant, I bring a Tupperware container and I just get them to put it in the Tupperware for me. According to the bylaw, the business must ask me whether or not I want a bag. That is part of the bylaw. So if they're not doing that, they are not in compliance with the bylaw and can be charged for that. Uh, Councillor Steve. Yes, thank you. I uh, really appreciate that clarification. I, um, I've had the chance to go through drive through and had the most elegant presentation of hash browns at 6 a.m. that I have ever had in my life and on a nice wicker tray. So. Um, you know, really appreciate that it is an adjustment. I think it's something that we're all used to having, but uh, just want to commend the team for the outreach that they've been doing. I know I've certainly been seeing a lot of the material that, that was highlighted in the presentation. Um, uh, I did have a quick question just in terms of, you know, monitoring the ongoing compliance. So really appreciate the monitoring data. I noticed, and I might have missed it, it doesn't seem to include sort of bylaw complaints or, or infractions as part of the monitoring. Is that something that we can maybe keep track of just to, to have a sense? Yeah, definitely. I think it's the reason we didn't include it in the slide is because it's so early days that we don't actually have any bylaw tickets being processed because yeah. it hasn't reached our bylaw officers for actual physical enforcement. So we're still in that very educational um, meeting with business owners, proactively talking to them, encouraging them uh, on, on their transitions and uh, whatever resources they need. So at that point, we don't have a whole lot of stats on the enforcement side yet, but we definitely could track them and, and bring them back if there's interest. Sure, in time. I mean, I think, I think uh, the education approach for now is really excellent. Um, you know, I think, I think at some point in the report it did talk about, uh, you know, call-ins with, with concerns. So even just having a sense to, uh, of how many of those are coming in would be, would be helpful. Um, but otherwise, really looking forward to the, um, uh, the, sorry, I've lost my note, but looking at the waste audits as well. And so just to clarify as well, is that going to be all waste streams? We talked about litter audits. Is that going to be public? Uh, waste receptacles as well as sort of commercial and residential or which which waste streams will be audited so currently we've been uh, monitoring the residential waste streams for for many reasons but for SUI in particular this year um, so that'd be the carts and the bins for both okay. the communal and the curbside programs and so we have some preliminary data starting on that um, and the public space waste containers would be our waste containers on our street corners or at the bus stops. And so we ran our baseline study this year and are just getting our results back from that. So we would plan to do another one um, of all three of those, again, uh, fairly regularly so that we can see that prevalence change over time and hopefully decrease per the goals. Great, great. Okay, thank you so much. No further questions. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So to follow up on that, um, with our population growing, but we hope to see a decrease, that'll be quite the feat. Um, are we actually going to see a decrease or are we just going to see maybe less of an increase? So it, it's per capita. So we're looking for a decrease per capita, not necessarily oh, capita. A, yeah, a total okay. decrease. Depends on right. our population growth. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So um, you said that uh, the goal wasn't just to reduce plastics, but reduce trash in general, which, uh, you know, I support. It's a good idea. In fact, it took me about a year to figure out how to, use, how to remember to bring in grocery bags, but uh, effective. So the question is, though, um, you know, going back to sort of the French fry container, that's one of contention. 
Uh, in our own bylaw, it says that food must be in a container, uh, a, but not. A, but uh, the French fries are an open container, and there seems to be some confusion about whether or not that goes into a bag or not. My position is that it should go into a bag. Um, what's the position of the bylaw? So if I think I understand your question right, you're, you're asking sort of about the definition of the primary packaging under our bylaw. Um, yeah, because uh, fries are obviously going to spill out everywhere. They've got no actual containment. Yeah, so they might as well be served on a napkin, honestly. <laughs> yeah, so our bylaw doesn't restrict businesses' ability to choose what that primary packaging looks like. So in some cases, it's a cup. Some cases, it's a sleeve. Um, so it's, it's still quite open to allow businesses to work with their packaging uh, determine, to determine what works the best for the customer. So we haven't restricted that to one type of primary packaging, but it, it, it is just that first kind of layer of packaging that we've been considering that primary packaging under the bylaw. Okay, so a business could throw basically what is an open package into a bag in order to ensure that someone receiving it doesn't have it spill all over the place as soon as it gets in their vehicle, for example. Uh, hypothetically, yes, but in that case, we would be doing something like removing the cup that fries come in and using a very small, like, primary packaging instead, not both and, if um, that makes sense. <laughs> it, no, it, it makes sense. I just don't know if it uh, actually scores with my reading of bylaw. Uh, that's interesting. Um, obviously, there's a lack of clarity there, and we should have that clarity. And that's why, what this check-in is for, obviously. Um, now, for takeout orders, um, third-party apps, they're putting a, a mandatory uh, charge. Um, what's the consumer option here? So in our discussions with the, the big um, third-party delivery apps, they are... Um, at least in our discussions, to allow a customer to opt out of the bag if they are going to pick up their own food. So if you decide to kind of pre-order your food and go in and, and get takeout, um, you can have the option of bringing your own bag and not be charged the fee. Um, in terms of the number of bags used, at the, this point it is the restaurants that will figure out how many bags you are using if you um, are doing takeout. Um, the, the customer can opt out of bags again if they want to pick up their own food, but it, it's really hard to opt out of the bag if you're choosing that convenient service that comes with the bag. Okay, well, another thing to put a flag on. Um, so the next question then is, uh, okay, so I definitely got uh, right at the start sort of an influx of people saying, what the heck is going on? I don't understand this. Um, but over time, people sort of got an understanding of what it, of what is happening. So are we going to be uh, measuring uh, going forward anecdata and stories and people saying it's great and people saying it's terrible or are we just gonna look at the data that will inform us so that we know actually if this is effective and how it is working? Well, the primary monitoring will definitely be data, so be data-informed decision-making and going back to our waste characterization studies and the data that we're gathering through our outreach team. Um, we'll be relying on that because that is really the bylaw in practice. Um, having said that, we aren't ignoring the feedback we're getting from folks' personal interactions and um, and their, their experience of the bylaw to help guide some of the changes that we're making, for example, to our website or any educational supports that we can put into place. So there's definitely a balanced approach, but our, our primary reporting is, is definitely data. Did you want to add anything to that? So I would agree with that. Uh, it is data. Where we would see people's stories would be in the complaints that we're receiving. We don't really have an avenue for the positive recognition other than some of the social media content that we see. But for the negative concerns with respect to the bylaw and the impacts on, on their livability, would be through the complaints we received. Yeah, I'm, I'm way out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hamilton. Yeah, I, I want to pick up on that. And, uh, like, I um, I guess maybe I share Councillor Paquette's sort of, I, I sense that there is a gap there. There's definitely a gap for me in understanding 
Um, so uh, I guess my first question, you know, picking up on what Councillor Stevenson had said uh, about monitoring, how do you set your baseline for whenever monitoring and enforcement starts? So where are you getting your, your baseline from to measure whether or not we've reduced the use of single use items? So you somewhat faded out at the end. Is it related to compliance or is it related to reduction? How are we going to measure, like, like what's your baseline? Where, where's your baseline starting on, on both compliance and sort of waste reduction on this? How are you measuring? How are you going to measure that when you start measuring it? So as it relates to waste reduction, we did waste characterization studies in advance of the bylaw. And then mm -hmm. on a, a scheduled uh, process, we'll find out what we see within those characterizations in the future. So we should be able to know based on our litter containers on the sides of the streets and people's uh, garbage at home as to whether or not we're seeing a change in the volume of single use items within our city uh, waste stream. As it relates to compliance, we're going to, we are starting with an education first as we transition into enforcement, it'll be a complaints-based uh, enforcement versus a proactive enforcement approach uh, within our community. Okay, so, so, so you're going to enforce based on complaints against people not complying with the bylaw. Uh, sorry, I, I, did I hear correctly? It's, did you ask whether or not um, business, our determination of business compliance will be complaint based, is that the question? Yes, yeah. Yes, initially that is certainly the approach that we're going to take. Now at okay. some point, depending on our waste characterization studies, if we start to see a lot of contamination or a lot of single use items, uh, we may decide to then take a more proactive approach. Oh, and um, my apologies for the issues I'm having with sound, I don't know what's going on, I'm trying really hard, I'll yell, but, um, the thing that I think Councillor Paquette brought up was that there's an ongoing, so so there's a, I'm gonna say a common sense approach. God, okay, sorry, I'm gonna just try different sound. Um, the, uh, there's, there's sort of an absence of a common sense approach here. And one of them is like you, in order for that fry container to become a, like the primary packaging, you probably have to add more packaging to that fry container. And I bring up the example of McFlurry spoons, for instance, which have, um, which are designed to connect to the machine. It's a plastic component designed to connect to the machine and then used for eating. And apparently there's anecdotal stories of people removing that spoon now throwing the plastic component away to provide a reusable spoon. So I'm wondering how you're attenuating sort of further steps in the bylaw, because that would require not just for, in the case of McDonald's, a change across the entire organization, uh, as well as uh, I think some contaminant issues in order to accommodate the city of Edmonton's bylaws. Or how are you addressing issues like that where there might be unintended consequences creating more waste um, um, this is Krista Berezowski so um, just my first time chatting so um, when we've looked at other jurisdictions they have um, we've we're, we're lining up with how other jurisdictions are going so I think that's kind of the direction that's that's how we've chosen the direction that we're going in is that Dennis Bayer certainly assisted in our environmental scan as to what is being recognized as best practice. Um, and in, in more specifically, I guess, to, to your comment, when we try, when we designed the bylaw, we really tried hard to prevent what you're describing. And so that's why we went with a single-use item and not single-use plastic. So the reason that McDonald's can't use that plastic stir straw, a stir spoon in their flurry is because of the federal re regulation, not the city regulation. And so, we really took an attempt at being uh, reasonable in the bylaw that we brought forward. What we're hearing from council is that we may have, um, as it relates to bags in drive-throughs, 
um, gone past what we perceive to be an acceptable reduction. And so that is something that as a team we know uh, we're not misaligned with uh, Vancouver, Victoria, Surrey, Banff, and uh, later Calgary, uh, who are also going down the exact same road, or who have or are going down the same road. So we know that we're not unique uh, in this approach to reducing single-use items. And we know that it is, it is a change. And we know that it is difficult for some, but we also know anecdotally and uh, in conversation that uh, we are seeing a reduction in some of these items which is aligned to the waste hierarchy. And sorry to take up your time, but yeah, that was kind of the where I was going with that, is that these jurisdictions are encountering similar bylaws across the country, and indeed across the United States. And we've tried really hard with the bylaw to align with those things so that we can minimize some of the, um, the impacts. We're not trying to be inconsistent with all the other jurisdictions that are passing these bylaws. We did an environmental scan. Our fees are in line with the fees that are being charged elsewhere. So is the bag policy. So these changes are coming. Um, we are ahead of them. And, um, but we're, we're hopefully not asking for anything that other jurisdictions aren't asking for. Recognizing, of course, what Dennis said, like there are hiccups in these things and um, we're, we're very open, I think, to, to feedback, you know, from all channels, so thank you. Councillor Tang. Yeah, great, thank you. Yeah, I thought the jurisdictional scan was quite interesting to see that we're really not that far off, although, you know, there's different timelines for different cities. Um, anything you gleaned in terms of what other cities are doing or not doing uh, that's kind of smoothing out their transition that we can benefit from? Um, you know, I'm noting Calgary will be following on our heels starting next year, and then, you know, again, the price point increase the year after. Um, any insights into kind of what they're doing with their rollout that um, maybe we could consider as we think about the next stage of engagement? Um, so we did as part of that jurisdictional scan and sort of on an ongoing basis, we've been keeping track of the rollout of these different bylaws across different cities and municipalities. So a couple of the ones that, um, that I'm aware of, um, so the city of Victoria, they had rolled out a bylaw and had to repeal it. Um, we did learn from there, um, from those reasons they've reissued their... Why did they, uh, why did they repeal it? It was repealed because the BC Court of Appeal ruled that the bylaw had been written from an economic hmm. and not an environmental perspective. And the latter required um, okay. yeah, approval from the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change oh, Strategy. Okay. So they've amended it and they have since reapproved it as of January 2020. Um, the, um, the city of Vancouver included a 25 cent fee for single use cups. And we did discuss that with businesses and that was and not it was, part of, it was one. a no go, yeah. like nobody wanted that. And I mean, and it didn't work for Vancouver either. So we're trying to learn, you know, again, not everybody is doing this. So we're kind of, you know, learning from the experiences that we see elsewhere. Um, and we are monitoring that on an ongoing basis. Okay. Um, and we did take the information that was available to us. We tried really hard um, to take that information and learn from it when yeah. we rolled this out. And just coming back to my question earlier about sort of differentiating between different paper bags. Yeah. Um, why are we not considering that in the bylaw? Why are we not differentiating? It's just right. one blanket fee yeah. for all sizes. Right, the so the overall goal of the bylaw is waste reduction. But it's not well, to change material. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's and the and the big reason for that is because we do want to reduce waste in Edmonton. The federal bylaw or the federal regulations are going to be removing plastics, but that's not necessarily going to be um, reduction. What we really wanted was to um, help people, help our residents. Um, reduce, the, reduce the items that they're using. Replacing one single-use item with another single-use item that's just made out of another material is still manufacturing the right. same things. It's it doesn't align with the goals. Yeah, yeah, and we still have to dispose of it. So that's the overall goal of the bylaw, yeah. is waste reduction. So okay. um, we're, again, if we can 
we, we just tried to keep that in mind when we were um, making yeah. decisions, yeah. I mean, I will say kind of in this first phase, you know, general feedback I'm getting from residents is that people don't mind charges in places like grocery stores. Many grocery stores have been doing it for a already quite a while before this bylaw. I think it is in the fast food differentiation. Um, and, you know, it's not fair for the business to take the heat from the customers and being blamed. Um, so I'm, I am wondering, you know, good to hear about the drive through info that will be shared. Um, is there anything else, communication resources or otherwise, that you think you will consider providing to businesses between now and the next change yeah. in price? So we do have an outreach team. So we have a dedicated group right. of people who've yes, been going out. Um, and that's where we've been getting some of our qualitative feedback as well. So, I mean, we've con we've converted it into pie charts and stuff like that. But we are hearing directly from the businesses. Um, and we're reaching out and talking to them. Right. Um, we have, and we gather data about what their barriers are and what, e what issues they're experiencing. This first attempt around the drive-throughs is certainly, let's give people more information. Let's give people okay. more signage let's give them signs that say like this is the city making this happen right. you know and we're we'd like to try um are yeah. you also talking to say like the headquarter yes. mcdonald for example yes. or more that corporate wide or at least you know sure. edmonton Be yeah yeah i'll let allison take that sorry i'll just add a detail to the drive-through stuff because that's the hottest topic um actually the the new resources we've been developing for drive-throughs have actually been somewhat in collaboration with um, some of our corporate contacts and local contacts with franchise owners. Okay. So this is really part of that relationship we've been building with them and the ongoing communications where we saw a need to give them a little more specific um, and targeted information with city logos on it to kind of take the heat away from their employees but also help customers know when they're in the drive through what their options actually are, what choices they're being asked to make to help improve that flow through the drive through and not um, see, you know, sort of any of that backlog happening or confusion. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm out of time. I just have one little question, but I'll come back. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So, presumably, uh, I mean, I looked it up very cursor cursorily, but um, the cost for an establishment for paper bags can range from four cents up to 25 cents or more, depending on the size of the bag. So when they are charging that 15 cents, was there any discussion with businesses that because they are now getting that 15 cents, that they could hold that into a cost reduction of their actual product since they're not incurring that cost anymore? Okay, I'll take a stab at this one. Thank you, Councillor. Um, <clears throat> so the City of Edmonton, we have the authority to um, ask, ask businesses to charge a fee. We cannot direct them how to spend those fees. Oh, no, of, of course not. Yeah, but, so. Did any business say, hey, great, I can pass uh, some savings on to the customer now that I can charge for a 15 cent fee? or spend it on environmental activities to help to reduce their environmental footprint. So yeah, there are certainly suggestions that we can, that we can, can make, um, but definitely we have no authority to impel. Okay. Does that answer the question? Well, it does. It's just, it gets problematic when people aren't given an option of whether or not they're paying for the bag, um, like delivery service or in a drive through that isn't following the bylaw by asking, and then people are just paying this 15 cents, and maybe they didn't even want that. Yeah. And you so know, it, it becomes problematic. I hope that people will let us know when that's happening. Um, no one's gonna let you know. <laughs> <laughs> I w it would be nice if the public would let us know. Um, and certainly, like I said, we have our outreach teams that are going out and visiting places. We're starting with that education first, where we hope to talk to businesses about where they're experiencing these difficulties and try to help them um, to help them get to compliance. Um, is there anything that you wanted to add to that? Really, like I said, it's very much about communication right now in this, sta in this stage. It's very much about talking to the businesses. Um, like, like we presented earlier on, um, something like 70, 70 Two percent of the businesses we visited, we haven't. We visited about forty percent, are compliant. So pe 
you know, businesses are doing okay, and that's really focused on the restaurants. So people are complying. There is a, there is a group of, of um, restaurants, restaurants that are having difficulties, absolutely. We have resources to go out and work with them, and we hope to get to a solution with them. Um, for businesses that aren't quite compliant right now, we, um, we work with them and ask them to give us a plan for when they will get to compliance, and if they can give us a plan with a concrete timeline, we give them that time. People have been talking about having difficulties getting you know, reusable cups for dine-in and stuff like that, so um, we're not, we don't wanna get to that place. We wanna work with people from the, for this first part of the implementation. Yeah, understood. Yeah. Uh, probably not related, but I, I've noticed I'm getting less complaints about overflowing garbage cans. <laughs> but uh, that could just be a whole host of other factors. I'll add so, that into our anecdotal evidence. Uh, yeah, <laughs> great. That's, uh, we should always make decisions on that. But uh, I'm being facetious, by the yes. way, if that's a, a transcript that someone's reading, <laughs> you will catch a tone in that text. But uh, the next thing is um, back to the fries. I got to get back to this. Um, so greasy fries, and I am now carrying grocery bags and so I can just pull out a bag if I want to throw things into the bag. That's not a problem, except the fries. They get greasy all in there. I've got to clean the bag. And even if I do, is it really still is it sanitary? That becomes an issue. So it's little things like that that can really like derail efforts and make it like just appear absolutely nonsensical. So uh, I think that, uh, you know, I'm not going to give you direction, but I think that maybe uh, can we take the hint that this is not working for people when it comes to they go through a drive through and get fries and for that open fry container to be handed to them? Because if they're picking it up for their family, that's, that's all over the place now. Yeah, so I, I think in order to ensure that our bylaw is drafted in the way that people are applying it, we have to have the words written clearly so that people know what they are and aren't following. So I think there's, there's um, we have to ensure that the manner in which we interpret is aligned to the, to the way that the bylaws are written. As it relates to packaging, I agree. Fries and hash browns. Hash browns are probably worse because they're even uh, more greased depending where you go. Um, if they want to double sleeve, so do a sleeve and a bag, well that's defeating the purpose. If they decide to have a closed bag versus, you know, the double, you know, the sleeve and the bag, they can do that. Um, but to enable uh, our interpretation to misalign with the wording of the bylaw would be very difficult. Yeah, so I uh, wonder if there's going to be a, a wording bylaw change at the next update if uh, we don't see that in general. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Thank you very much. French fries and hash browns are two of my favorite things. I'm very much enjoying this conversation. Um, but also feel, so you know, um, again, we've talked about some of the, the adaptations that people can potentially make. So bringing Tupperware with them to contain the, the French fries, uh, which can be washable, dealing with the grease. Um, so, th you know, there are those, those options to, to explore. Uh, great. Well, I will, I'm happy to put the motion on the floor that works, yeah, okay. I will put forward that the September 5th, 2023 City Operations Report CO0992 be received for information. Um, and I will have some closing comments, but I will yield the rest of my time. Okay, thank you, Councillor Tang. Um, just a couple of final questions um, to round out some thought. Um, so that, san that piece about sanitation, back to the fast food <laughs> uh, drive through they bring things out onto a tray, and I guess, you know, lots of people are wondering, so they're gonna take that tray back and just constantly kind of bring it out to a new group of people. So folks are worried about sanitation, uh, and that, I get it, is a bit of a business practice. You know, how do they wanna deal with this? We don't have, I'm, I imagine we don't have anything that specifies as a fast food drive through thou shall do A, B, and C in between sales, right? Um, I don't know, just any feedback, on, any comments on that? 
I, I think part of that discussion also falls under AHS jurisdiction, which is um, part of the discussion we were having with them when we developed the bylaw and the right. idea of reusables and the safety of reusables, um, you know, following the heels of COVID, how safe are reusables? And so I think that discussion is ongoing with them. It's been a very positive one. And I know they have a lot of food handling guidelines in place um, that um, complement our bylaw as well. So. In terms of sanitation, there are very safe ways, and I know with the drive-through, handing it on a tray is just as sanitary, really, as handing it on a tray inside the restaurant. It's For just dying. completely different, I guess, than what we're used to um, habitually. So yeah. it, it can be a little bit challenging, I guess, from that end, from a kind of a more cultural standpoint. But I guess more. Uh, I guess my point then, from a sanitation perspective, given that AHS has been fairly consistently looped into the conversation. You know, the bylaw is here not to bypass those concerns, but really to abide by whether city or AHS guidelines. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. And um, I guess, you know, earlier you had mentioned the point about there's going to be a group of business who's going to be, it's going to be difficult and, you know, we're here to work with them, et cetera. I guess I'm also thinking about the consumer side. I'm, I imagine there will be a group of consumers who will be perpetually challenged by this transition. Um, we don't have an outreach team that goes out to you know, visit every single person, obviously. But beyond information and education, kind of if you think about like from a user group perspective, what do we do there? So primarily we use the same channels that residents have for all okay. of their other, um, their other you know, ways of, of expressing concerns. So um, we do have online information. Um, we do have awareness campaigns. Um, and we do have a waste, we have 311, we also have a waste customer support line specifically for folks. Um, but yeah, we don't have a specific, um, it's kind of probably more the awareness campaigns would be how we would reach uh, residents in general. Is there anything you wanted to add, Allison? And then for the awareness campaign, did you like kind of already roll that out? Or is it just kind of what we're seeing right now? It's, it, it was ruled out, I believe, just before July 1st. Allison, yeah, okay. you can give me the details. Like banners and billboards <laughs> and that kind of stuff? Yeah, so we did start with like our web resources already as early as 2022. So a lot right. of web resources, particularly supporting businesses, talking about the upcoming rules, what that's about, the videos, all of those were launched on our website already last year um, after the bylaw was approved, after the public okay. hearing. And then this year, we did definitely ramp up and double up on the ads and social media channels to encourage that awareness and, and catch like people in all different... Bus shelters and... Yeah, out-of-home advertising, okay. yeah, digital boards. Um, it's been, you know, two months since the implementation. Are you planning on coming back with another implementation update at some point? So we, the bylaw does need to come back because it needs to align to the federal legislation that's coming out. Right. So those yes. are legislative alignment changes. Okay. Um, I guess I'm just wondering, like, what are some of those milestone, like, looking ahead? The yeah, so the federal next one? year, we'll, uh, once we do our next characterization study, is a great time to say, okay, what are we seeing? Are we, are we seeing improvements? Are we not? Um, are we continuing to hear? Because often you see with, with change in, in expectation, that initial concern and then it dies off. Is that continuing? Is there yeah. a continued you know, concern with respect to, as we say, the bags and drive-throughs? At that point, we can certainly take um, a, a review where we have some data, we have some time, uh, and we know what is actually being impacted from a waste reduction perspective. So that would be a great opportunity for us for our next you know, true discussion on sure. the content. Yeah, and I guess specifically on the drive-through, fast food, that paper bag issue, it's not affected by the federal regulation because they're just focusing it's on plastic, not. but that could be the next po checkpoint where we actually say, okay, we get in, we've given it some time, we've seen how it works, and now we, let's revisit whether or not we should keep going with this. Correct. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. That's clear. Thank you. Councillor Paquette. Oh, just to speak briefly. Any other questions for administration then? Uh, okay, not seeing any. Uh, speaking to the motion then, Councillor Paquette. Thank you. So I uh, just want to thank administration. Uh, this is probably one of the least fun uh, things to work on, uh, on one hand, and maybe a lot of fun on the other, I don't know. But, uh, you know, there's obviously going to be some, uh, there was, 
uh, initially a lot of heat from the public um, facing a little bit now. So, and this is ultimately council's bylaw. So thank you uh, for your aplomb and for patiently answering our questions, really appreciate it. Um, obviously all bylaws that are new need a little bit of adjustment over time. And I think that uh, that's something that we'll see here. Um, but a lot of things will gain a lot more clarity as more municipalities um, bring in their own bylaws, which they will. And when, as the federal government brings in uh, their legislation, which we know is absolutely coming, and there may be uh, also paired with some provincial legislation. Um, this, this is a, a big conversation. It also um, uh, is connected to extended producer responsibility and how that packaging is presented to the public and what their responsibility is. So there's a lot going on. Um, ultimately, uh, it leads to a cleaner city, um, more responsible use of our resources. And, uh, you know, those aren't always bad things. And um, yeah, so thank you. And thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Yeah, also um, a lot of gratitude for the team working on this. I, you know, it's not uh, it's not exactly an easy um, bylaw to roll out with, and I actually appreciate quite you know very comprehensively um, how you thought of uh, so many different aspects. I can appreciate that for this first phase, you really focus on education and information. That's great. I also you know heard that there will be other checkpoints along the way for us to um, kind of think maybe beyond some of those tools. Um, yeah, it's it's not, you know, I thought the jurisdictional scan was was particularly interesting. Um, it's not just city of Edmonton, we're not doing this in a silo. You know, a lot of cities are following our heels and we have so many other regulations and legislation changes coming down the pipeline. Um, I, I, think, I think it's good that we're getting ahead of the curve and kind of going above and beyond. Um, and I, I know in previous conversation, we've talked about how a lot of businesses have gone above and beyond well before any of this have started and um, and we're really just following on the leadership of, of, of a lot of the businesses in the private sector. Um, you know, I think for, I, you know, I really, so anyways, I support the motion that to receive for information. I think we need to give this some time to implement and really see the results. Um, but so far, you know, we, I, I, this is a bit of a, it's almost, it feels like a very similar trend line to um, the three stream separation where you get lots of feedback in the first few months and it, then people does transition and they change their behavior, et cetera. Um, so I'm, I'm, and from the answers I got today, I, um, you know, we ask these questions because we hear about it. People come up to us in the community and ask about these things. Um, and I, I actually feel the, 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 the answers are strong, the rationales are strong. So um, I, Look forward to see how this will really help towards our reduction and diversion goals. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Councillor Stevenson, to close. Great, thank you very much. You know, we want to start by acknowledging that transitions are always hard and that change can be difficult to, to adjust to. Uh, but I'm so grateful to all the Edmontonians who are making that adjustment to the 72% of businesses that are already complying and the others that are working, actively working towards that. Um, I think I think that's outstanding and, and a huge credit to our community um, and also you know really deeply appreciate administration's work to to walk alongside those businesses to support them um, I love that we're not out there issuing fines right off the bat that we're giving that time that space recognizing that I think most Edmontonians do share that desire to to reduce our uh, environmental impact the cost that we all bear uh, when it comes to managing our waste in the community uh, I look forward to, to seeing the ongoing monitoring. I'm excited for that. I, I've never been so excited about waste characterization studies, so really looking forward to that next one coming back to us. Uh, and just want to say thank you again so much uh, for the work that you're doing. Thank you. All right, thank you. Please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. That is carried. That completes the items on our agenda. Are there any notices of motion or motions without customary notice? I believe Councillor Jans had a notice of motion. Councillor Jans? Yeah. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Giving notice that uh, at uh, the next council meeting, I'd like to move that administration provide a report on the feasibility and required budget for procuring a multi-unit building design in the point to access block style, meeting the permitting and regulatory requirements for a typical city lot that could be made freely available, e.g. open source, to help reduce the overall cost of housing development due date second quarter 2024. Great, thank you. Notice is received. Are there any other notices of motion? Not aware of any and not seeing any, so thank you for that. We are adjourned.